welcome back i think we are on the way to discuss on the clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis which is uh, going to be very important let us start uh, with the clinical features as we discontinued from the previous session so the clinical feature wise i can divide into two uh, first i'm going to divide into something called as articular manifestations and uh, they also have extra articular manifestations articular manifestations and extra articular manifestations remember whenever your rheumatoid factor or acpa levels are very high whenever the antibody titers are very high it usually indicates uh, uh, that you'll have a risk of developing extra articular manifestations as well the more the antibodies are more is the risk of developing extra articular manifestations overall extra articular manifestations are associated with a poor prognosis in fact they will be associated with the severe disease that's one point that you need to know and uh, of course as far as the articular features are concerned typically you will be getting some kind of an early morning stiffness that's going to be there for more than one hour and uh, classic disease that is uh, uh, seen in rheumatoid arthritis is a symmetric type of more of an a synovitis which rather progress to an arthritis later on then uh, instead you will have a uh, because it's a more of an inflammatory type of arthritis you will have pain and stiffness that's going to reduce with usage of the joint or uh, reduces with uh, more usage and more working of the joint and uh, typically they are going to have a kind of a am pain rather than a pm pain so all the features of inflammatory arthritis will be there so we need not uh, discuss once again because we have already discussed in the uh, previous session itself and what are the joints that will be affected that is the question here remember rheumatoid arthritis is basically a disease of the small joints that is the first point that you need to know it's basically a disease of small joints any disease that does not involve small joints at all throughout the course of the disease is unlikely to be a rheumatoid arthritis in the first place they are going to have the small joint involvement and what is the most common small joint that is involved in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis the name itself suggests it's mcp because mc has mc in it so it's the most common joint that is involved in rheumatoid arthritis that is the metacarpophalangeal joint so as far as upper limb is concerned the other joints that can be involved is pip even though wrist joint is given as a large joint in many uh, rheumatology textbooks and orthopedic textbooks but still wrist according to rheumatoid arthritis i will consider as a small joint only because from rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis perspective it will be a small joint only so these are the three commonest joints that involved in rheumatoid arthritis as far as the lower limb is concerned the most common small joint that is involved in lower limb is going to be the metatarsophalangeal joint this is going to the most common uh, small joint that is involved in the lower limb as far as the large joints are concerned in the upper limb you can involve the elbow joint you can involve the shoulder joint not a problem as far as the lower limb is concerned the knee joint is going to be the most common large joint that is going to be involved you would also somebody ask you the most common large joint involved in rheumatoid arthritis it is a knee joint that is the most common large joint involved in rheumatoid arthritis the most common small joint and the most common overall joint involved in rheumatoid arthritis answer is going to be the metacarpophalangeal joint that's going to be the most important apart from that if they ask you the characteristic rheumatoid distribution so characteristic rheumatoid distribution is going to be the uh, mcp pip and the wrist joint this is what we refer to the characteristic rheumatoid distribution and uh, even hip joints can be involved but uh, much lesser compared to that of the knee joint to be honest and one important point with regards to the shoulder joint is there shoulder joint involvement is not that common in rheumatoid arthritis but it can be seen in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis in males males with rheumatoid arthritis have a little higher risk of having shoulder joint involvement rather than other patients so that's why that shoulder has some one important point to be noted and then they can involve some axial joints also axial joints axial joint involvement is first of all to be honest very rare in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis uh, but they can have very rarely for example temporomandibular joint involvement can be there which might be uh, resulting in difficulty in uh, you know like uh, biting chewing and all this stuff so tmj involvement can happen but rare not so common and they can have cricoarytenoid joint involvement which can result in voice changes can happen but still not very common so little rare and at the same time you can have involvement of the spinal joints spine 
So if somebody asks you what is the spine, uh, that will be very commonly involved in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. You should straight. It's a straightforward question. You should answer it's the cervical spine. That is the most common spinal area that will be affected with rheumatoid arthritis. Remember, rheumatoid arthritis does not affect any other part of the spine. So that's a very important point because uh, ankylosing spondylitis is a disease that affects every part of the spine except cervical spine. Whereas rheumatoid arthritis is a disease that's going to affect only one part of the spine, that is the cervical spine. Apart from that, uh, they're not going to affect any other part of the spine in the first place. Okay. And sometimes in very severe cases, this spinal involvement can result in a sort of an atlantoaxial instability on the resulting atlantoaxial subplex vision. And that can result in development of quadriparesis because of cervical spine compression. So if somebody asks, what is the reason for development of quadriparesis rheumatoid arthritis? I would suggest that this patient is having a atlantoaxial subplex vision because of the cervical spine involvement. And it's very important to understand what are the joints that are spared in rheumatoid arthritis. Of course, whenever I ask this question, the first joint you're going to tell is the DAP joint. Absolutely spared in rheumatoid arthritis because that will be involved in psoriatic arthritis, typically. And apart from that, you have sacroiliac joints, which is typically spared in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis because that is involved in seronegative spinal arthritis very commonly than rheumatoid arthritis. Then thoracolumbar spine. As I told you, only cervical spine will be involved in rheumatoid arthritis. So thoracolumbar spine is not involved in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. So involvement of these areas should give rise to a suspicion of another different form of arthritis in the first place. At the same time, next point that you need to know uh, is the deformities. Whether deformities happen in rheumatoid arthritis or not, of course, the answer is yes. Everyone knows the classic deformities. And the reason for development of this deformities in rheumatoid arthritis is tenosynovitis and not arthritis. Many students think it's arthritis that's the reason for development of deformities in rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not the case. It's tenosynovitis that's going to be the reason for development of deformities, whatever we see in rheumatoid arthritis. And most common deformity in rheumatoid arthritis is ulnar deviation of fingers. Ulnar deviation of fingers, most common deformity, like your uh, fingers may go like this, ulnar deviation of fingers. Apart from that, uh, you can have other classic deformities like uh, kind of a boutonniere kind of a deformity. Then you have swan neck deformity. Please don't ask the spelling of boutonniere. I, I don't know the spelling of boutonniere. So that's why I'm writing like this. It's a typical medicos way of escaping the spellings. So boutonniere deformity, then you have span neck deformity. Then of course, you're going to have something called a Z deformity of the thumb. You have the Z deformity of the thumb. Uh, which is also referred to as something called a hitchhiker's thumb. Hitchhiker's thumb. And you can get deformity in the lower limbs also. For example, in the lower limbs, uh, you can get something called as uh, hammer toe. That's common. Hammer toe, claw toe, which can happen. Which I'll show you in some time. What, I mean, if you see the image, you'll understand much better. So you have, can have a hammer toe, you can have a claw toe, and uh, you can also get uh, something called a pianoco. This is not a lower limb deformity. So I can write here. It's a type of an upper limb deformity only, where you can have something called a piano key deformity. Piano key deformity, which is also referred to as something called a floating styloid. So these are the deformities that are very typical of rheumatoid arthritis. But I mean, nevertheless, it's very important to understand that uh, any disease that causes significant tenosynovitis can produce all these deformities, which means uh, rheumatoid arthritis is not the only cause of the deformities, even though it is classically described for rheumatoid arthritis. You can get in many other uh, disorders also, like even SLE can produce similar kind of deformity, which you'll be seeing subsequently. So let us, let us go back to the images and see what are the kinds of deformities you can get. First one, is going to be the classic boutonniere deformity and whatever I showed you are classic rheumatoid distribution. Like here you can see uh, the PAP joint involvement, MCP joint involvement, and you have the wrist joint involvement. Very classic of rheumatoid arthritis. This is the rheumatoid distribution and DAP is typically spared in rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, you can see the boutonniere deformity over here. So what is boutonniere deformity? Boutonniere deformity is basically uh, hyper flexion at the PAP joint and hyperextension at the DAP joint. So there will be a DAP hyperextension 
and a PIP hyperflexion. So that is classic Boudinna. And the Swanak is going to be the exact reverse. There will be a DIP hyperflexion and a PIP hyperextension, which means PIP will show hyperextension and DIP will typically show hyperflexion. So which means uh, it's going to look like a swan neck. So that's like that. So you can remember like a DAP hyperflexion. So remember how to um, remember this is very simple. Remember only one. So I generally tend to remember only this uh, hyperflexion of the DAP is swan neck. If you remember only because swan neck is like this. So you can remember that hyperflexion at the DAP is swan neck. Then opposite is going to be in the PAP that is hyperextension at the PAP. And of course, the exact opposite is going to be the botaner. So there will be hyperflexion at the PAP joint and hyperextension at the DAP joint. To understand botaner deformity, botaner deformity is, uh, I mean, so to understand Z deformity, that is hitchhiker's thumb, Z deformity of the thumb, you can imagine like a sort of a botaner of the thumb. I'll tell botaner of the thumb is the hitchhiker's thumb, that is Z deformity of the fingers. So in the thumb, you don't have DIP and PAP. In the thumb, you have only one intraphalangeal joint and uh, one, I mean, one and a metacarpophalangeal joint. Here, the metacarpophalangeal joint, you can imagine like a PAP, even though it's not a PAP. Here, the um, intraphalangeal joint, you can remember like a DIP, not a uh, intraphalangeal joint here. So if you understand and if you uh, equate the botanist deformity here, so in Bodens deformity, you are going to get hyperflexion at the PAP and hyperextension at the DAP. So on the other hand, because it is Bodens deformity of the, I mean, because it's thumb here, so I will just replace that with, I'm just going to replace that, that with hyperextension of the interphalangeal joint and the hyperflexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint. So you can equate this, uh, each Icos thumb or botanist, I mean, uh, the Z deformity of the thumb with the botanist deformity that you've already seen. So just you have to change that uh, perspective. MCP, you can imagine like a PAP there and uh, the interphalangeal joint, you can imagine like a DAP there. That's all. If you understand this, it will be easier. That's nothing but a botanist of the thumb. That is each Icos thumb or Z deformity of the thumb. So this is a classic Swanek deformity where you can see DIP hyperflexion and PIP hyperextension. This is an example of a botaner of the finger. So where you have a PIP hyperflexion and a DIP hyperextension. This also shows, I think, a Swanek deformity where you're having a DIP hyperflexion and a PIP hyperextension. And this is an example of a hammer toe and a claw toe. So what do you mean by hammer toe? As far as hammer toe is concerned, you can see that uh, it means that PIP flexion and uh, DIP extension. So this is going to produce a kind of a toe called as hammer toe. So there'll be a PIP flexion and a DIP extension. So this is sort of an hammer. So why it is, an MTP will be neutral in this location. Why it is called as a sort of a hammer is because so, you know, like whenever the PAP is flexed and DAP is a little bit extended like this, the toe hits down like sort of hammer. So that's why this is called as hammer toe and MTP will be neutral in this setting. And after this, you can see this uh, kind of a claw toe also. In the claw toe, the PAP will and DAP both will be in flexion so that uh, they will bend down like a claw. So DAP, PAP both will be in a sort of a flexion. So that is basically a claw toe both will be flexed. So PIP flexion with DIP extension, it is sort of like a hammer that hits the floor. That's why it's called a hammer toe. And both flexed, they'll become like a claw. That's the basic idea of a claw toe. And we have seen this, we have seen this. This is another example of a rheumatoid hand and one of the earliest deformities you see. I think this is the ulnar deviation of fingers, which is very well visible. Even in this X-ray, this is an extensive and a late severe form of rheumatoid arthritis where you can see this uh, deviation of the fingers towards the ulnar border and the multiple areas you are seeing subluxation of the joints. That is because of severe tenos and arthritis. And uh, this is a bad sign. This is a very bad hand actually. So, and that's one of the very important deformities. And this image shows the rheumatoid nodules, which we'll be discussing in some time. One of the important extra-articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis is nothing but a rheumatoid nodule from that perspective. 
fine. So these are the deformities that you're going to see. That is the classic deformities. Uh, the Z deformity, the Boutinet deformity, the Swan neck deformity, and we are also seeing the uh, hammer toe and the claw toe. And apart from that, there is something called piano key uh, ulna styloid. I mean, piano key deformity that is called as floating styloid. So what is the reason for this? I think people who have studied orthopedics should be able to tell what is the reason for development of this kind of piano key deformity, otherwise referred to as piano key ulnar head or floating ulnar styloid. So what is the reason for this? Anyone? I think people are there, 71 participants are there. So anyone? Yes. Uh, not extensor carpi ulnaris, it's more of a ligament rupture. That's an ulnar collateral ligament. That is due to rupture of the ulnar collateral ligament. That will result in something called a piano key deformity of the ulnar styloid, or I can also call it as a floating ulnar styloid. Typical deformities. Uh, I mean, you might not get direct questions. You might get some uh, image-based questions based on this. That's why this is important. And apart from that, one of the other important articular problems is the development of Baker cyst. Baker cyst can happen in the setting of osteoarthritis itself, but uh, Baker cyst typically happen uh, in the setting of synovitis, in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. So that's also very important. So remember, first of all, Baker cyst is due to synovitis when it happens in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, it will produce a posterior, I mean, posterior swelling in the knee, that is popliteal force of swelling. That's how it comes. And it can produce a leg swelling also because of extension uh, into the popliteal fossa. And they extend between, catastrophic between two muscles. That's important to understand. So this is a typical example of a Baker cyst. Uh, what you're seeing here is there will be two heads uh, of the two muscles. One is the semi-membranosus muscle and second is the semi-tendinosus, I mean, gastrocnemius muscle, what you're seeing here. So between these two heads, because of synovitis, uh, there will be enlargement of the synovial membrane and cavity that is protruding out into the popliteal fossa. And this is what we refer to as Baker cyst. And between what two muscles it's getting uh, enlarged outside, that's very important. It's between two muscles, that is semi-membranosus and gastrocnemius and you can very clearly see that this baker cyst is still in communication with the original synovial cavity so sometimes it can present like a dvt also where you can see asymmetric swelling of the legs like this where the cyst can enlarge and come out like this and they can cause severe calf pain and one of the important differential diagnosis here is deep vein thrombosis which you should not uh, try to miss and this is due to synovitis and uh, the differential diagnosis as far as Baker cyst is concerned is two. One is go going to be the deep vein thrombosis and second is going to be the popliteal aneurysm. Popliteal aneurysm. As far as popliteal aneurysm is concerned, it will be pulsatile in nature. So it can be easily found out. As far as Baker cyst is concerned, it will be a non-pulsatile swelling. So that's how clinically you can differentiate from a popliteal aneurysm. But DVT, you need a DVT screening scan definitely is important. And you can find out through a CT of the leg also, where you can see a clear cystic structure that is going in the posterior aspect of the popliteal fossa and into the calf muscles. But nevertheless, DVT has to be ruled out in this setting. So that's a Baker cyst. Remember, Baker cyst is not the only finding of rheumatoid arthritis. It can be seen in the setting of a osteoarthritis as well. Suppose if they ask you the investigation of choice for Baker cyst, I will go for a MRI to see the extent and I have to especially see the communication with the original synovial cavities. That communications can be well established with the MRI of the limb. So I'll go for MRI usually. And it can be a painful condition. Okay, after seeing about the articular manifestation, it's important to know about the extra-articular manifestations. So if somebody asks you what is the most common extra-articular manifestation, your answer should be lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy is going to be the most common extra-articular manifestation and it will be more of a Centralized lymphadenopathy rather than a localized lymphadenopathy. And um, if, if lymphadenopathy, and uh, that is due to activity of the disease. So uh, if the disease is very active and the B cells and the T cells are going to keep on proliferating, and over a point of time, this hyperactive lymph nodes can result in the development of non Hodgkin lymphoma, which is supposed to be the most common cancer associated with uh, I mean, rheumatoid arthritis. And the usual type of cancer will be, NHL will be DLBCL. The usual type of uh, NHL that happens in the setting of a uh, rheumatoid arthritis is again going to be a DLBCL only. And we can get a cardiac involvement even. In the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, if they ask you the most common uh, 
uh, I mean, feature of cardiac involvement rheumatoid arthritis is serocytis, that is a pericarditis, that's the most common presentation of cardiac involvement. And of course, they're going to present with pain, you know, that's pericarditis pain. And they can come with tamponade, but very rare. It's not common. And uh, if they ask you the most common valvular heart disease that is associated with rheumatoid arthritis, answer is going to be mitral regurgitation. And there are some connective tissue disorders that you need to know, which produce some valvular heart disease. One is rheumatoid arthritis, most common is mitral regurgitation. Then in SLE, most common is mitral regurgitation. Then um, in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis, it is aortic regurgitation. In the setting of acute rheumatic fever, it is mitral regurgitation again. In the setting of rheumatic heart disease, it's going to be mitral stenosis. I mean, these are the most common. Most common valvular heart is involved in different, different conditions kind of disorders. So the most important thing is to understand AS in ankylosing spondylitis. Here AS means ankylosing spondylitis. In ankylosing spondylitis, most common is AR, not uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. And at the same time, in rheumatic heart disease, it is, again, mitral stenosis. We know that. But in acute rheumatic fever, it is MR. Remember, acute rheumatic fever is a little different from rheumatic heart disease. Both are not the same in the first place. And uh, then we can have pulmonary involvement. Pulmonary involvement is quite notorious in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And the most common pulmonary involvement will be pleuritis. Again, cirrhosis is very common in rheumatoid arthritis. So pleuritis and associated pain is extremely common in rheumatoid arthritis. And they can develop pleural effusions, the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. If they are going to develop effusions, usually this effusion is very characteristically exuded and they will fulfill the lights criteria of course and uh, very known for extremely low glucose in the sense uh, the glucose can be as low as 20 or 30 in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and these glucose i mean these pleural effusions will contain low complements as well because of the complement consumption because there will be hyper complement activation in the dis i mean throughout the body in the rheumatoid arthritis patients so there can be complement consumption because of that this pleural effusion may have uh, low complements. So, and that's very important differential from rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. So, remember in rheumatoid arthritis, the efficiency tend to be large and they tend to be extremely low glucose, whereas in SLE, the efficiency tend to be small and they tend to have a normal or a only mildly reduced glucose. Other features can match between both these things, but uh, usually these are the two findings that's very important to differentiate between rheumatoid arthritis related plural efficiency and SLE related plural efficiency. That's why that uh, low glucose finding is traditionally very important. Many times even exam, they ask you the cause of extremely low glucose in plural efficient in the uh, in the setting, you should first answer rheumatoid arthritis only. That's a well-known cause of extremely low glucose, plural fluid glucose. And they can also result in development of ILD, that is interstitial lung disease, Parenchymal lung disease. ILD, if they ask you the most common type of ILD in rheumatoid arthritis, I will answer UIP as the most common cause, that is usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, why that point is important? Because in all other tissue disorders, like SLE, Jogren syndrome, or uh, probably scleroderma, NSIP is supposed to be the most common, that is non specific interstitial pneumonia. Only rheumatoid arthritis, you will have usual interstitial pneumonia as a most common. Uh, pattern that you get in ILD and the most common area I mean zone that is affected is the lower lobes because UAP tends to love the lower lobes so lower lobes are the ones that are very commonly affected remember in other CTDs also lower lobes are the ones that are commonly affected which means any condition disorder if you have an associated ILD lower lobes are going to be the most common area of involvement but if you take the pattern the histological pattern rheumatoid arthritis will catastrophically produce a UIP pattern that is usual intestinal pneumonia pattern mm -hmm. Whereas uh, other CDDs is going to produce non-specific intestinal pneumonia kind of a pattern. And apart from this, they can produce something called bronchiolitis obliterans. If you don't treat it faster, this can be completely fatal. It can develop in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, at the same time, there is another entity called Kaplan syndrome. You know, what do you mean by Kaplan syndrome? This is uh, background pneumoconiosis which increase the risk of development of rheumatoid arthritis. Once they develop rheumatoid arthritis, they develop rheumatoid nodules in the lung. So this combination is what we refer to as Kaplan syndrome. Suppose if somebody asks you where the rheumatoid nodules are common in the lung, it will be common in the upper lobe. And compared to ILD, rheumatoid nodules have a decently better prognosis 
compared to ILD, which usually has a poor prognosis in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. Remember, ILD, lower lobe, UAP pattern, whereas rheumatoid nodules, upper lobe, with a relatively better prognosis compared to that of the ILD that you see in rheumatoid arthritis. And if you say histopathology, if you see what will be seen in rheumatoid nodules, it will be just vasculitis, the local vasculitis that will be prominent in the setting of a RA nodules. And they can get skin involvement also. Skin involvement in rheumatoid arthritis. And if they ask you the most common picture that you will see in skin involvement in rheumatoid arthritis, of, of course, going to be the subcutaneous nodules. And uh, there are some points that you need to know about the subcutaneous nodules. These are going to happen on the pressure points very commonly and very common on the extensor surfaces. Extensor surfaces, especially on the elbows and the dorsum of the wrist, dorsum of the hand. Extensor surface is very classic. They happen in the pressure points and uh, they are painless and they're going to be mobile in nature as well. They're painless, mobile, present on the extensor surface of the upper limb typically, especially on the elbow and on the dorsum of the hand, it's very common. It's painless, mobile, and uh, it's due to vasculitis again. The superficial vascular, vascular, I mean, vascular involvement in rheumatoid there is a reason for development of subcutaneous nodules as well. And apart from that, you can have ocular effects, eye involvement in rheumatoid arthritis. What is the most common eye involvement in rheumatoid arthritis? You have to answer that. So we have seen a lot of extra articular manifestations. What is the most common uh, way of involving eye in rheumatoid arthritis? I'm getting a variety of answers. I'm getting episcleritis, I'm getting scleritis, I'm getting antriviitis. Interestingly, I'm getting a Sika syndrome also. Keratogonid is Sika. First of all, you need to know if there is one thing that cannot happen in rheumatoid arthritis, that is antriviitis. It cannot happen. It's impossible to get in rheumatoid arthritis because it is a feature of SSA, seronegative spondyl arthropathies. Uh, it is not a feature of zero positive arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is basically an example of a zero positive rheumatoid arthritis. So that's not possible. So antrivitis is wrong. So if there is one thing that does not happen, your answer will be antrivitis. And if they ask you most common, of course, it is Sika syndrome. It's going to be the most common, which means that dry eyes. That's the most common feature of rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, eye involvement in rheumatoid arthritis. That's also referred to as something called a secondary Jogren syndrome. Either way, it's true. The most common uh, eye involvement in rheumatoid arthritis is secondary jogren, and the most common cause of secondary jogren is also rheumatoid arthritis in the world only. So ocular effects, you need to know for sure that Sika is the most common, even though scleritis and episcleritis can happen. There are a lot of differences between scleritis and episcleritis you would have seen. Usually episcleritis is more superficial. It doesn't have that much of pain. And when you uh, use this topical phenylephrine drops, the vessels will blanch because it's superficial. But on the other hand, if you take episcleritis, it will be associated with more pain, more redness, and more complications. At the same time, uh, when you use this topical phenylephrine, the vessels will not blanch because it's more deeper in nature. So deep, not blanching with phenylephrine, and uh, more severe uh, pain and uh, more severe vision involvement, episcleritis. I mean, scleritis, sorry. I completely confused, I messed up, sorry for that. Episcleritis is more superficial, it's going to, yes, correct. So episcleritis, I think I messed it a little bit because I confused the sort of little bit between. So episcleritis is more superficial and uh, it is usually not as if that much of pain. Vision will be usually intact. So there'll be no problem in the vision as well. And when you use topical phenylephrine, it's going to blanch. The vessels are going to blanch easily. And as a scleritis is concerned, it's more deeper. Uh, vision may be affected in this setting and they may be associated with pain and they may have more redness. And if it's a topical phenylephrine, the vessels will not blanch because it is more uh, deeper in nature. And next, one more finding that you can see very commonly in the setting of uh, rheumatoid arthritis is the splenomegaly that you encounter in rheumatoid arthritis. Generally, splenomegaly is mild. It will not be uh, massive or moderate. Why you get only a mild splenomegaly? Because... Uh, 
the disease is still active. You know, like spleen is also an area of, uh, I mean, this uh, proliferation of the inflammatory cells. So there will be a mild form of splenomegaly indicating the disease activity. But getting a massive splenomegaly is very rare. Whenever you get a massive splenomegaly, you think about something called a Felty syndrome. This I'm going to talk about next, uh, which means the hematological involvement. That's really important. Hematological involvement. As far as hematological involvement is concerned, the most common hematological involvement in rheumatoid arthritis will be anemia. And usually it will be anemia of chronic disease. Because of chronic disease itself, you will get anemia. That's the most common finding. But uh, another important uh, hematological problem that you need to know is the Felty syndrome. Felty syndrome. So that's why I told you whenever you get a massive splenomegaly, you suspect Felty syndrome in the exam. So what is the triad of Felty syndrome? You know you're going to have uh, erosive and probably a severe form of rheumatoid arthritis as a background. You will obviously have something called a leukopenia, uh, but in general, it's a neutropenia that's prominent. And of course, the third part of the triad is the massive splenomegaly. Massive splenomegaly. So that's important here. And of course, if you see one of the important DDs for Felty syndrome is something called the LGL syndrome. That's called as large granular lymphocytic leukemia, LGL syndrome or large granular lymphocytic leukemia syndrome. So it's like a form of a leukemia. It's basically an NK cell tumor, NK cell leukemia. And that's a very important differential diagnosis because rheumatoid arthritis itself can result in NK cell tumor. That is large granular lymphocyte syndrome. And uh, large granular lymphocyte syndrome also has the same triad as that of Felty syndrome. Same triad of Felty syndrome. So you should not actually call it as Felty syndrome. So I can, I wrote just because you, for you to understand, it's going to produce the exact same triad. They can have neutropenia, they can have mass cystinomaly, and they can have uh, this, I mean, severe form of rheumatoid arthritis. All these things can be seen in LGL syndrome also. But the only way to differentiate is to do a peripheral smear. And in that, you'll be finding out this LGLs, large granular lymphocytes. If this is there, then the diagnosis should not be Felty syndrome. And the diagnosis should be LGL syndrome only. That's a close DD and it's a very important DD as well. And if you do an IHC, if you put a stain, this is usually will be 16 and 56 positive. We know, isn't it? Sexy 16 are natural killers. Uh, we know that. So anything that's related to six, sexy six are natural killers. And especially girls who are 16s are sexy and uh, they are natural killers. We know that. And of course, don't remember 56 girls. I told sexy six, including 16 are natural killers. So they are markers of natural killer cells, basically. So that's seen in NK cell leukemia, like LGL syndrome. And if you identify this, then the diagnosis is completely different. So that's why before making a diagnosis of Felty syndrome, don't forget this, LGLs. If you don't have LGLs, then you can diagnose a Felty syndrome. If you have LGLs in the peripheral smear, then even with the same triad of Felty syndrome, it's not Felty syndrome. It is basically uh, your uh, LGL syndrome only. Clear? And cool. We know. And uh, we have, I think we have completed all the extraticular manifestations. And uh, apart from that, there are some areas which are very rare. What are things that are not involved very commonly in rheumatoid arthritis? For example, so many things you have seen, but GAT involvement I have not have told, which means GAT involvement is extremely rare in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. Then second, renal involvement. Renal involvement is again extremely rare in rheumatoid arthritis. If a patient who's coming with a prominent renal involvement in rheumatoid arthritis, the disease is not rheumatoid arthritis, it might be SLE. SLE has a prominent renal involvement. Rheumatoid arthritis will not have prominent renal involvement in the first place. Suppose if the patient has renal involvement, if in case the patient has renal disease, and if somebody asks you what is the most common renal disease that a patient gets in rheumatoid arthritis, it will be amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is the most common because of the double A amyloid. We know that because double A amyloid is an amyloid of chronic inflammation, and that's going to be the most common. And uh, apart from that, you can get uh, something called a membranous glomerulonephritis, membranous nephropathy. That's the second most common after amyloidosis. So in case that the patient develops renal involvement, and ultimately both are going to present as nephrotic syndrome only. So in late stages, very you know like advanced stage of rheumatoid arthritis, you can get uh, uh, nephrotic syndrome. But in uh, 
early stages, if there is a prominent renal involvement, I don't think it's really going to go towards rheumatoid arthritis. You don't really get. Siddharth is asking, gonads are involved in rheumatoid arthritis. No, not really gonads are involved, but due to variety of causes, these patients may have hypoandrogenism. Hypoandrogenism possible. And uh, major of the times, uh, I mean, this direct involvement of gonads on rheumatoid arthritis is not uh, a very important finding. I mean, not very well proven, but more than that, this could be possible due to the medication effects that we're using like methotrexate and uh, we're using variety of drugs like sulfasalis and all these drugs can cause reduced sperm counts in the, uh, I mean, semen of the males. So probably that is probably the reason why some textbooks are giving hypoandrogenism that is acid rheumatoid arthritis. But nevertheless, I don't think there's any textbook that gives direct evidence of hypoandrogenism in patients with even with severe rheumatoid arthritis. So I don't think so. But the drugs we use, that's going to the most important, especially the methotrexate and sulfasalazin are extremely commonly used drugs in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, which can well cause male pattern of infertility, which means they can produce reduced sperm counts in the semen. So that could be probably the reason. But this is a very controversial thing. But I don't think rheumatoid arthritis is a direct involvement. But you can get a lot of cases of rheumatoid arthritis patients with infertility. That's because of drug effect most of the times. And uh, peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy can happen in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. But remember, most often peripheral neuropathies will be more of a uh, entrapment syndrome because of amyloidosis and many other reasons. You can develop carpal tunnel syndrome. So you know, whenever you have a carpal tunnel syndrome, you are going to have affection of the median nerve. So it's a median nerve entrapment syndrome. That's carpal tunnel. And you can have a tarsal tunnel syndrome as well. Tarsal tunnel syndrome as well, which is uh, entrapment of the posterior tibial nerve. Posterior tibial nerve. That is called as tarsal tunnel syndrome. And then they can get third most common, but it's rare. That's cubital tunnel syndrome. You know, cubital tunnel syndrome is an entrapment syndrome of a ulnar nerve. They can get ulnar neuropathy also. So fine. So there is some chances rare, but uh, peripheral neuropathy, G8 involvement, renal involvement are basically rare. All these things are basically rare. You don't get that commonly. But if you get, I told you what all you will get. Amyloidosis common, carpal tunnel syndrome common. If you tell which is the most common among uh, the rare things. As I told you, the most common NHL is, uh, and most common cancer is NHL. In the NHL, it's going to be usually DLBCL. I think this is more than enough. We have discussed enough about the extraarticular manifestations as well. And now it's time to tell the most common cause of death. So what's going to be the most common cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis? It's quite simple. It's going to be the cardiovascular death. They're going to cause a lot of vessel damage, vascular damage. I mean, uh, uh, there will be acceleration of atherosclerotic disease. And most often they're going to die of uh, cardiovascular death only. Clear? And... Uh, SLE also same. SLE also it's cardiovascular death. Except scleroderma. The only CDD that produces respiratory death is uh, scleroderma. They often die of respiratory failure. That's because the lung involvement is very typical in either they will cause pulmonary hypertension or they will cause a uh, parenchymal lung involvement. So usual reason for death in scleroderma is respiratory failure. But in SLE, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you should answer cardiovascular death only. Very commonly due to myocardial infarction because of the severe damage to the vessels that uh, these patients will be encountering. And after this, we need to know about the investigations. As far as the investigations are concerned, uh, you need to first think about something called rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is more sensitive, but a little less specific. But these kind of things are not uh, uh, good to tell in clinical practice because rheumatoid, rheumatoid factor as well as your ACP has almost equal sensitivity with the current expertise. Second investigation that you can do is ACPA, that is anti sulfur peptide antibodies. So they tend to have a little bit of higher specificity and lower sensitivity. So this is very true because specificity of uh, your ACPA is almost 95 percentage and above, more than 95 percentage. Whereas the sensitivity of uh, ACPA is supposed to be around 50 55 to 70 percentage, whereas specificity of rheumatoid factor is very less. It's only 50 to 60 percentage, whereas sensitivity of 
Lambda factor is approximately around 75 percentage. But nevertheless, the sensitivity is not important here. The specificity is very important. The most specific antibody for rheumatoid arthritis is going to be ACP only, that is anti citrullinated peptide antibodies. And uh, rheumatoid factor is not specific, we know that. But we need to know what is rheumatoid factor basically. It's uh, antibody. Uh, it's an antibody that is direct against the FC portion of the another antibody. That's all. It's an antibody that is direct against the FC portion of the another antibody. This antibody is usually an IgG, which is targeted. And this antibody could be IgM or it could be IgG or even it could be IgA, doesn't matter. And this antibody that is targeted against the FC portion of the IgG antibody is what we call it as something called a rheumatoid factor. This basically is the rheumatoid factor, RF. And commercially speaking, the only one rheumatoid factor that we measure is the IgM rheumatoid factor. That is the only thing that we commercially measure. And it's also the most common type of rheumatoid factor circulating in the body of any individual. Could be rheumatoid or may not be rheumatoid arthritis. But IgM rheumatoid factor is the most common. And that is the one that is measured in commercially in the laboratories also. We don't really test for the IgG and IgA rheumatoid factors. So what is rheumatoid factor? It's just an IgM antibody against the FC portion of the IgG antibody to have a very precise nomenclature. But it, rheumatoid factor can be IgG and IgA also, but IgM is the most common. As I told you, it's not specific in the sense it should be seen in many other conditions, right? So usually the mnemonic for what are the conditions where you can see rheumatoid factor positivity is uh, given by a mnemonic called chronic. So C stands for any chronic disorders, many chronic disorders, can produce rheumatoid factor positivity, although in a little bit of low titers. Then H stands for hepatic uh, problems, hepatic problems like uh, primary biliary cirrhosis. PBC can have rheumatoid factor positivity. And apart from that, uh, you can have pulmonary problems, chronic that can also be told under chronic itself. So for example, pulmonary problems like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can result uh, in the development of rheumatoid factor and certain pneumoconiosis also can have a positive rheumatoid factor. Pneumoconiosis, like silicosis, asbestosis, they can also have a positive rheumatoid factor. Then R stands for your uh, rheumatic diseases, other rheumatic diseases. Like, uh, for example, you can get in the develop, I mean, setting of uh, Jogren syndrome, other rheumatic diseases. And you can get in the setting of a SLE, systemic lupus, erythematosus. And uh, you can also get in the setting of a scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. You can get uh, rheumatoid factor positivity. And uh, N stands for neoplasm. A lot of neoplasms can produce uh, uh, rheumatoid factor positivity. Uh, for example, you have... Uh, Hepatocellular cancer, which can also has been shown to have some element of rheumatoid factor positivity and uh, infections. The classic infection I'll talk about is, I mean, HCV, HBV and uh, infected endocarditis, where you have studied that uh, in immunological criteria, uh, rheumatoid factor positivity is one of the important entities. So you have that condition. So, I mean, this is an overall mnemonic and many other diseases are there. Like, for example, you have something called a mixed condition disease that is MCTD where you can develop uh, rheumatoid factor positivity. So many areas. So it's not like, uh, you know, like it's going to be seen only in rheumatoid arthritis. That's very important. Apart from that, old age. So O stands for old age. Old age itself can result in development of rheumatoid factor positivity. For example, uh, if the patient is having age more than 65, in that setting, there is a 20% chance that the patient may have a RF positivity, rheumatoid factor positivity. So old age can have rheumatoid factor positivity. So this mnemonic is not a very good mnemonic, but just to tell that a uh, uh, lot of other conditions also will have a positive rheumatoid factor. So that is the idea of this entire mnemonic, but nevertheless, you know, like not very important. Then apart from that, uh, you can, uh, you know, like get rheumatoid factor 
uh, in other conditions like uh, general population, like for example, five percentage of the general population itself can have a rheumatoid factor positivity in extremely low titers. So, which means a positive rheumatoid factor does not really mean that the patient is going to have a rheumatoid arthritis in the first place. So, how will you differentiate? For example, these disorders which I'm talking about, um, you know, like these are going to have rheumatoid factor usually at low titers only. They will not have high titers. But in rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to be an extremely high titus. And uh, that's one important point. So the titus, there is no specific cutoff for the titus. But if you see a, a very high titer based on a laboratory cutoff, so like three times, four times more than the upper limit of normal, then think about having a rheumatoid arthritis. If they're just elevated, just two times, less than two times the upper limit of normal, in that setting, you think about having a other costs apart from rheumatoid arthritis. But again, the context will vary, which you'll be seeing in some time. I'll see in some time. I'll tell you in some time. What about the rheumatoid factor and how to diagnose based on uh, rheumatoid factor in ACPA? As far as the ACPA is concerned, ACPA has two different types of antibodies. One is going to be the anti-CCP, that is anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide. And second one, we have something called the anti-MCV antibody, that is anti-mutated citrullinated vimentin, anti-MCV. So you have two types of ACPA, but uh, anti-CCP is widely available commercially, but anti-MCV is available only in selected centers, but both these things will come under ACPA, that is anti-citrullinated peptide antibodies. Uh, let us see, based on the rheumatoid factor and ACPA values, uh, let us see the interpretation of the disease. For example, the patient is having RF positivity as well as ACPA positivity. RA is extremely likely in this scenario. Rheumatoid arthritis is the likely diagnosis here. Suppose RF is positive and ACP is negative, or I can write first this one. RF is negative and ACP is positive, means again rheumatoid arthritis is very likely because ACP is very specific for rheumatoid arthritis compared to uh, rheumatoid factor. If RF is positive and ACP is negative, so in this situation I'll see the titus, if it's in high titus, then again I will tell RA likely but you have to carefully evaluate the clinical findings. If RF is positive, ACP is negative, but RF is present in low titers, you can still have a rheumatoid arthritis, but you have to think about other conditions that elevate the rheumatoid factor as well. You have to think about many other conditions that can elevate the rheumatoid factor. So you have to, especially when it is in low titers, you have to be a little careful and very careful assessment of clinical findings are very important. Suppose if RF is negative, ACP is also negative, then it makes the rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis extremely unlikely. And uh, this group of patients are the ones we typically call it as zero negative rheumatoid arthritis, basically. But wait on. Before making the diagnosis of zero negative rheumatoid arthritis, you have to be very, very careful. So you are going to make a zero negative rheumatoid arthritis, all right. There is a term like that in practice, but you have to rule out many, many other conditions. The first thing you have to rule out is other zero positive arthritis has to be ruled out. So like for example, the most important is SLE. So you have to do ANA. So you have to prove that ANA is negative. Rule out that thing that is SLE. And uh, you have to rule out uh, Jogren syndrome related arthritis. You have to rule out scleroderma related arthritis, which can present similarly. And at the same time, zero negative spinal arthropathies has to be ruled out before telling zero uh, negative rheumatoid arthritis. For example, SSAs has to be ruled out. The most important in the context of rheumatoid arthritis is going to be the psoriatic arthritis. That has to be ruled out. So, and many, many other diseases are there, which I'll tell you in some time. So, after ruling out all these possibilities, then only you have to make a diagnosis of zero negative arthritis. Most of the zero negative arthritis diagnosis that is made in uh, clinical practice is actually wrong. I believe that zero negative rheumatoid arthritis is something which is a bad diagnosis to make in clinical practice because having a negative rheumatoid factor and negative anti-CCP or negative ACPA usually makes the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis completely unlikely. You have some evidence. The antibodies are the most important. That's going to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis likely. Otherwise, it's very, very unlikely to have rheumatoid arthritis. So in that setting, either you are missing out a other type of seropositive arthritis or you're missing out a completely different diagnosis like psoriatic arthritis or other forms of peripheral arthritis. So you have to be a little careful in that. And you can still make a serial rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis, but only after ruling out other conditions. That's why I wanted to emphasize on that particular fact. Suppose, let me tell, uh, the patient is having 
RF negative, ACPA negative, still you are making a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Of course, okay, fine. So now you called as a zero negative rheumatoid arthritis. And this disease is going to have a good prognosis or this is going to have a poor prognosis. So what is your take? Whether they'll have a good prognosis or whether they'll have a poor prognosis. If you make a diagnosis of zero negative rheumatoid arthritis, I'm getting a variety of answers saying that the diagnosis, I mean, the prognosis is poor. I just, I say the prognosis is good, basically. Remember, the antibodies are everything in rheumatology. That's one thing that you have to be very clear about. Antibodies are everything. Whenever antibodies are present, that is going to be severe. That's all. As simple as that. Then don't think about anything. Whenever the more antibodies you have, the poorer the prognosis is. The lesser antibodies you have, better the prognosis. It applies for SLE, it applies for scleroderma, it applies for jog run, it applies for rheumatoid arthritis, it applies for everything else in uh, rheumatology. So for example, if somebody asks you what are the markers of poor prognosis, I will tell HLA, DR4 positivity, poor prognosis. If the patient is having ACPA positivity, poor prognosis, rheumatoid factor positivity, poor prognosis, especially if they are in high titers, extremely poor prognosis because they are going to they, they mean that they are going to cause a lot of extra articular manifestation as well that also comes to a conclusion that presence of extra articular features is again a poor prognostic factor because both are interlinked with each other when you have extra articular features you are going to have a higher titus of antibodies and both are interlinked with each other and of course presentation with deformities presentation with erosions presentations with deformities very poor problems because you have missed the bus in that setting which means uh, you have to treat in the early phase itself now you have missed and the patient is coming in the late stage of rheumatoid arthritis any erosions deformities it's actually a late stage so the disease might not go for remission like as you would expect so early rheumatoid arthritis goes for remission very fast but late stages very difficult to control because the disease has established itself that's why called as an established rheumatoid arthritis and if the presence of i mean erosions are happening within a year after diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, which means it's very early erosions, very hyperactive disease, poor prognostic state. Female sex, as such, is going to have a poor prognosis. I told you, females are going to have a poor prognosis overall. And uh, presence of disability. Disability, the patient is walking with a walking stick already. Poor prognostic sign. And uh, so many, so many are there, but I think this must be enough. So these are the basic poor prognostic features as far as rheumatoid arthritis are concerned. Now, after knowing about the investigations, I mean, of course, we do the x-rays. I'm not telling we don't do the x-rays. We do the x-rays and we see for the erosions, which I've told you already, and look for the deformities. We look for the osteopenia near the periarticular region. So x-rays are also mandatory and it's important for follow-up also. Let us move on to the treatment. As far as the treatment is concerned, the first thing we need to know is the flare because this disease is supposed to have a unpredictable flare number one at the same time this is one disease uh, that can present with a severe acute inflammatory arthritis uh, i mean they can present in a very you know like bizarre manner also the patient will be having fever the patient will be having elevated total count so maybe think of some infection so once you make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis the idea is to either bring down the that flat that the patient is having or if the patient is coming for the first time you bring down the inflammation as quick as possible so which means whenever the patient is coming acutely or with a flare so in that setting of course my treatment will be based on uh, early immunosuppression with steroids so depending on whether it's a monoarticular flare or a polyarticular flare my treatment steroids will vary but if it's a monoarticular flare i'll be using intra articular steroids intra-articular steroids, so which means I'm going to inject the steroids directly into the joint. If it's a polyarticular flare, then in this setting, I'll be using a systemic steroid. Like for example, I can use an IV steroid or a oral steroid as well. Oral is very commonly preferred, but you can use IV steroids also. But more importantly, before doing this, especially for a monoarticular uh, flare, before doing this, 
please rule out septic arthritis which means the basics are always the basics which means you have to do sinal fluid analysis and joint aspiration that's why i told you the investigation of choice for any monarthritis especially large joint monarthritis is going to be the joint aspiration and sinal fluid analysis because if you are the joint is septic because rheumatoid arthritis patients are prone for infections as well because they are actually using their uh, immunity towards something which is not necessary autoimmunity so they might not be having sufficient immune reserve to fight against infections and at the same time most of the patients who come with a flare who's already a known case of rheumatoid arthritis means they'll be already taking a lot of immunosuppressor drugs like methotrexate so there is always a chance of infection and infectious arthritis so rule out septic arthritis at any cost then inject the steroids into the joint otherwise it will become a catastrophe if it's a septic arthritis and injecting a steroids into the joint be careful about that so of course if they ask you the treatment of acute flare it's always the steroids nothing else but you need to uh you know, like treat uh, for chronic maintenance therapy as well so for chronic therapy for maintenance therapy for rheumatoid arthritis you are going to use a group of drugs called demats these are called as disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs you would have been studying for a long long time about this demats these demats are basically non targeted therapies which means they act diffusely throughout the immune system and they are trying to down regulate the immune system in the first place so as far as demats are concerned uh, most of them are oral drugs the uh, first of all you have something called a bed therapy so let us draw something like this so you have a bed therapy so there are two drugs that can act as this sort of a bed therapy one is the methotrexate or alternatively you can use leflunomide so among these two if you want to prefer only one i'll always choose methotrexate methotrexate forms the backbone so which means i can write these are the backbone of ra therapy so either you have to start with methotrexate or leflunomide if you have a contraindication methotrexate then you can if the patient is having some contraindication to methotrexate or the patient is uh non tolerating methotrexate then in that setting you can start with leflunomide as a bed therapy but at any cost methotrexate is the bed therapy and it should always be in the guide i mean always be in the uh basic protocol it should never be discontinued unless until it's contraindicated or not tolerated and upon that if the suppose the patient is not responding but you will take a cut off of around 3 to 6 months usually any chronic disease if in 3 to 6 months the patient is not going for remission a uh, patient is not responding in that particular setting we'll be going for uh, treatment with other drugs for example we can treat with uh, a sort of uh, sulfasalazin or we can use other drugs like uh, hcq which is very commonly used in the setting so i can write a other add on therapy so this is i'll just change the pencil okay this is basically going to be a sort of an add on therapy so other demats can be added to it so typically i'll be adding sulfasalazin and uh, probably hcq so this is the second line i'll be adding after methotrexate so whenever you have this form of methotrexate with sulfasalazin and hydroxychloroquine we called as a classic triple therapy this is what you mean by triple therapy and if the disease still doesn't respond and if you want some additional treatment then you can move on to biological agents this is the next step biological agents the advantage of biologicals is you can use as a add on therapy or you can use as a sole therapy sole therapy means i'm talking about a monotherapy you can use as a single therapy or you can use as an add on to methotrexate sulfasalazin and hydroxychloroquine also there are many different types of biologicals we have and the commonly used biologicals is anti tnf drug usually you start with anti tnf this is the first drug to start with suppose if you have a poor response with first drug then you have a different second drug second anti tnf drug so still if you get a poor response then you have to discontinue anti tnf drugs and uh, uh, you know like you have to go to the another biological so discontinue anti tnf as a whole remember here second drug means you discontinue first and you add the second it is not like methotrexate you keep it and you add uh, the second drug so first drug will be discontinued and second drug will be added if second drug is also showing a poor response then discontinue the anti tnf drug as a whole there is no purpose in giving beyond that and you can use 
anti IL six therapy also. Anti IL six. I mean, you can read anti IL six receptor. This is basically tocilizumab is what I'm talking about. So usually tocilizumab uh, will be given whenever the patient is having unpredictable flares. Whenever the flares are extremely high and that the patient is not tolerating that unpredictable sudden sudden flares, then you can in that setting you can add a tocilizumab, or you can have other biological agents like uh, abatacept can be tried, which breaks the immunological synapse, or you can have other biological agents like rituximab, which reduces the production of antibodies, that is anti-CD20. Rituximab can be tried, especially if the patient is having extremely high titers of antibodies, ACP and rheumatoid factor, then you can try rituximab. Of course, it's valid because whenever you have a, that high titers of antibodies, uh, especially when you have extra articular manifestations, so rituximab will be very helpful in that scenario because they don't titrate the antibodies, because they destroy the B cells that are going to produce those antibodies. And you have many, many different drugs out there. You can try biological synthesis. This is a typical escalation that we do. But on the other hand, there are certain DMARTs which are not used or very sparingly used nowadays. What are the DMARTs that are not used? One is gold and second is deep penicillin. These are also DMARTs that uh, that will be given in many pharmacological textbooks, but they are generally not preferred in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis because of the side effects are very high. And uh, in case in low resource settings, you can use, but very, very sparingly used. They are not used nowadays, in fact, because of very, very high rate of side effects. And we have more efficacious drugs compared to that of the uh, gold deep and element. And one drug that can be used but not that effective in rheumatoid arthritis is azathioprine. Azathioprine, compared to other demands you're talking about, it is less efficacious, but still it can be used in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, still approved in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. So, but the basic bed therapy is MTX or leflunomide, but there are some situations where you can add MTX and leflunomide together also. But as far as a beginner level is concerned, understand that MTX and leflunomide, to start with, we don't really add together. We give any one of them. But the main drug is MTX, that's the gold standard, bed therapy, baseline therapy. On top of that, you add sulfazalin hydroxychloroquine. If they still don't respond, then you can move on to the biologicals. In the biologicals, the first choice drug is always the anti-TNF therapy. Then you can uh, cap, I mean, typically move on to more and more drugs in this setting. So as far as biologicals are concerned, they can be used as an add-on therapy or you, they can be used as a sole therapy also. So, which means you can use them, use them as a monotherapy, especially that question will be asked in with regards to anti-TNF, where anti-TNFs are drugs that are well approved for use in monotherapy in this setting. You, you need not really uh, uh, give along with uh, other oral drugs, not a problem. So this is the overall maintenance therapy of rheumatoid arthritis in a nutshell, but you need to know the side effects as well. So you know what are the side effects of methotrexate? What are going to be the side effects of methotrexate? You know, the mechanism action, any uh, pharmacology student or any second year, third year student, if you ask, they, they will blurt out just like that. That's a folate antagonist. And that's going to be DHFR inhibitor, dietrofolate reductase inhibitor, not a problem at all. But as far as the side effects are concerned, that's going to be important. But the most important side effect uh, that you're going to get in the setting of methotrexate is uh, mucositis, very common side effect, especially with higher doses. And they can get gastrointestinal side effects, again, because it's a suppressor of cell proliferation in areas where there is high cell proliferation. Buccal mucosa, GIT, these are the areas that they are going to have higher cell proliferation. And they are highly teratogenic and they're category D or X category drugs, which means you cannot use these drugs in pregnancy. Pregnancy is an absolute contradiction for usage of this drug. And we know once upon a time, we have been using this drug as a MTP. Now, currently, even now, we use this drug for ectopic pregnancies to abort them. And once upon a time, actually, this drug was used for MTP before the advent of Mephipristone, RE486. So it's an highly teratogenic drug and pregnancy is an absolute contraindication. It was used as a drug for aborting, not for uh, pregnancy, of course. And they can produce severe bone marrow suppression, especially with unregulated intake without checking the CBC properly. And uh, periodically, if you don't check, you can go for severe bone marrow suppression, anemia, leukopenia, thromocytopenia, or pancytopenia, anything can happen with uh, methotrexate. You can get hepatitis, and this is one drug that can result in cirrhosis with unregulated intake. And they can cause pulmonary fibrosis as well, pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis also, if you don't uh, take care of this properly. So all these things should be addressed very clearly. And remember, 
that these three uh, are indications to stop methotrexate if there is any evidence of bone marrow suppression hepatitis or pulmonary fibrosis or pneumonitis it's better to stop methotrexate need not give methotrexate typically in the set i mean uh, people will ask like just elevation of otpts uh, whether is it enough to stop methotrexate or not answer is no uh, if there is at least more than three times elevation of the sgot and sgpt or sgot or pt especially pt is very important in this scenario if it is elevated at least more than three times the upper limit of normal so in that setting you can stop methotrexate or any um, evidence of bone marrow suppression or any evidence of pneumonitis or pulmonary fibrosis it's very important that you immediately discontinue methotrexate of course in uh, pregnancy i don't even give this drug but with mucositis and minimal gat side effects you can continue this drug no problem and to reduce the side effect and you know very well that this drug can be given with a compound called folinic acid that's called a folinic acid rescue so you can give this uh, methotrexate along with this folinic acid to reduce the side effects that's a very important question in exam as well and apart from that uh, methotrexate is something that has a renal elimination it's renal eliminated drug so you have to be very careful in the setting of renal failure so you have to do dose adjustments in renal failure renal failure in severe toxicity you have an antidote suppose the patient is having severe toxicity especially in the setting of bone marrow suppression uh, when the patient is coming with serious infection you have a drug that is going to act as an antidote no leucovorin is nothing but folinic acid this is leucovorin that's not the case so what is the antidote for that in the sense like this is a direct methotrexate antagonist it can cleave the methotrexate directly what is the drug that's called glucarpidase glucarpidase is basically an enzyme that can basically cleave the methotrexate directly and it's considered to be uh, one of the antidote for methotrexate in severe acute toxicity when the patient is coming with severe bone marrow suppression fever neutropenia no total wbc are not there at all in the blood so in that setting you can use glucarpidase and remember renal elimination is very important point because uh, you need a lot of dose adjustment in patients with renal failure and more importantly methotrexate is something that is given as a weekly dose it's not given as a daily dosing and that's very important to tell to the patient because many times if you just write 5 mg of methotrexate the patient will be taking starting to take methotrexate daily that's the one of the biggest changes with methotrexate it should be given as a weekly dose not as a daily dose so usual dose of methotrexate we give in rheumatoid arthritis 5 to 25 mg per week it's a weekly dose not a daily dose which means once per week is the dose clear that's very important uh, because if you give daily dosing in rheumatoid arthritis you are going to result in severe bone marrow suppression and many times that's the main reason for developing bone marrow suppression because the patient doesn't know and if it, if you don't explain that properly they'll go for severe bone effect suppression and have, we have lost a lot of patients because of methotrexate even though it's a very good drug but one of my neurologist elder sister she is 62 years of age taking methotrexate sorry as is unregulated intake did not check the cbc actually she came with a total count of just 240 total count the total wbc count neutrophils are just 11 percentage in 220 if you take the number of neutrophils only 20 now neutrophils are there she came with sepsis we tried everything we couldn't save she died in 48 hours so this is a very dangerous drug and you have to keep that in mind for sure is not going to be such an easy drug and uh, as far as leflunomide is concerned what is the mechanism action of leflunomide everyone knows that uh, methotrexate is going to inhibit dhfr folate antagonist whereas leflunomide is going to inhibit a enzyme called dihydrooretate dehydrogenase dihydrooretate dehydrogenase inhibitor that's how leflunomide is going to work with and leflunomide is also teratogenic it's a category d drug basically so which means it should not be given in pregnancy it's a teratogenic drug it cannot be given in pregnancy of course i'll tell you i'll come back to that at the end so what are the safe drugs in pregnancy uh, side effects are extremely similar to that of uh, methotrexate so very similar so they can cause bone marrow suppression they can cause uh, hepatitis but they can they won't cause pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis but they can cause hepatitis uh, and they can cause bone marrow suppression so they are teratogenic they can cause hepatitis and more importantly this drug also can result in 
bone marrow suppression. But compared to methotrexate, it is not that effective. And it's again contraindicated in pregnancy. You cannot give this drug. And uh, one other important area where leflomid is useful, I mean, apart from CDD, I'm just asking just to boost your uh, knowledge. What is the other area where leflomid can be used? Apart from this country tissue disorders, apart from malignancy. Any idea where leflomid is used? Because I might forget in that area. That's why I'm telling now itself. Because I suddenly remembered that. Anyone can tell. I'm talk, not talking about CTD. I'm not talking about a cancer. Cancer will easily tell. One of the important is in mesothelioma. And not uric acid. Disorders. Lefnomid, not lepra reaction. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm expecting one answer. Like an examiner, that is BK virus nephropathy. In BK virus nephropathy, you can use methotrexate. Uh, that's quite, you know, like, I mean, surprising, isn't it? In BK virus nephropathy, in post transplant state, where you develop a polyomavirus infection of the kidney, where they go for graft failure, in that setting, you can use, uh, uh, you know, like uh, leflomid. Leflomid is known to be effective in the setting of a BK virus nephropathy because leflomid produces one metabolite. That is called as A77 metabolite. That's A77 metabolite. And that uh, is known to have antiviral effect against the BK virus. Like how we tell no nowadays chloroquine, how it has antiviral effect and how ivermectin has antiviral effect like that. Lepnomide produces a metabolite called A77 that is basically having an antiviral effect. So it can be used in setting of a BK virus nephropathy. And if at all, if someone asks what are the safer drugs in pregnancy, among all these drugs, I will choose sulfazalazine, safe, HCQ, safe, azathioprine, relatively safe. So these are the three drugs that are safe in pregnancy. So one important use of azathioprine is in pregnancy. Suppose if methotrexate uh, is being uh, used by the patient and the patient wants to get pregnant, so instead of methotrexate, I can use azathioprine in those ladies. So one area where azathioprine will be beneficial. So that's a good drug, azathioprine, in the setting of pregnancy. But remember, even azathioprine can cause neural tube defects. So you have to give, even the FDA doesn't approve use of azathioprine. It's one of the very commonly used drugs in pregnant, pregnant patients. So you can give additional folic acid. Like I told you, you can give up to 4 milligram per day folic acid if you are going to use azathioprine to prevent the development of neural tube defects. Apart from that, reasonably and relatively safe in pregnancy. Absolutely safe. Definitely HCQ is very safe in pregnancy and sulfazalin is also very safe in pregnancy. So this is something which is important to know. At the same time, anti-TNF drugs, yes, they are safe in pregnancy. Other biologicals have not been studied extensively in pregnancy, but anti-TNF drugs are considered to be relatively safe in pregnancy. If they ask you the most safest anti, I mean, anti-TNF drug that is that can be used in pregnancy, that is cetolizumab. Cetolizumab. Cetolizumab is considered to be extremely safe in pregnancy, but uh, even though it's very costly. Why? Because, because it's zoo. And uh, one reason is because it doesn't have the FC fragment at all. And it will come in pegylated formation. It has no FC fragment. If you don't have an FC, FC fragment, how can they bind to the placental receptors and move into the placenta in the first place? They don't move at all. So cetolizumab doesn't contain them the FC fragment. So they're considered to be very safe in pregnancy. And all the anti-DNF are basically safe in pregnancy. And uh, best used after 16 weeks. Once you cross 16 weeks, they are extremely safe. But before 16 weeks, if the disease is not controlled, then you can try. Then their risk-benefit ratio will come. But after 16 weeks, nevertheless, you can use. There will be no problem. So very safe in pregnancy. Again, anti-TNF drugs, there is no question about that. But in exam, usually they will test on sulfazalin and HCQ only. They are considered to be very safe in pregnancy. And what are the side effects of sulfazalazine? Somebody asks you what are the side effects of salin, what you will tell. Uh, very importantly, they can result in something called agranulocytosis. Agranulocytosis, then uh, they can cause something called uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is possible. They can, they can result in something called a reversible male infertility. Reversible male infertility. For that matters, even methotrexate can result in a form of a reversible male infertility. You can write here also. They also cause reversible male infertility, which means they uh, reduce the sperm counts. But they do not cause female infertility, but they do cause male infertility by reducing the sperm counts, both sulfasalazine as well as the methotrexate. And they can uh, 
yeah that's all these are three important side effects i need you to i need you to know then we have hcq hydroxychloroquine in high doses hydroxychloroquine can produce retinal toxicity we know that but it is much lesser that's why we have the hydroxy derivative it's much lesser compared to the chloroquine and much lesser compared to that of other dangerous compound quinine but they still in high doses can produce retinal toxicity so an off the evaluation before starting this drug is important to see the fundus and uh, most common side effect is nausea and vomiting clear retinal toxicity as far as hydroxychloroquine is concerned then what else i think we have completed the treatment of these uh, agents so i think this must be enough and what are the side effects of anti dnf drugs we have not talked about that very commonly used drugs i mean this is a very different entity and anti dnf drugs itself you know like is very dangerous and to start with anti dnf drugs you need to definitely uh uh you know like uh, do something called a mantra test or a igra test before starting anti dnf drugs anti dnf drugs can produce bone marrow suppression anti dnf drugs can produce reactivation of latent tuberculosis latent tuberculosis and uh, anti dnf drug because of bone marrow suppression they can produce increased risk of infections as well anti dnf drugs can produce dial that is drug induced lupus erythematosus i think one answer i'm getting is flare up of sle remember sle is nowhere related to dial dial is different sle is different anti dnf drugs do not cause flare up of sle but they cause something called a dial that is drug induced lupus erythematosus so that's a completely different entity and it is having absolutely no relationship with systemic lupus erythematosus so that's dial so drug induced lupus erythematosus then uh, yes that's all this is what i'm going to talk about and there was been a small question on increased risk of lymphomas with that of anti dnf alpha drugs uh, but this is a very very uh, you know like controversial statement whether they produce or not we don't know that's why i put a question mark because when you are using anti dnf alpha drugs in rheumatoid arthritis means the disease is going to be very active which means it did not respond to your baseline therapy it did not respond to your baseline bed therapy that you have start with anti dnf drugs in such an active disease when you are going to use anti dnf drugs the patient can develop a lymphoma just because the disease is active i told you one of the most common cancers that develop in a de novo rheumatoid arthritis patient is non hodgkin lymphoma so that's why there has been a considerable confusion whether this anti dnf drugs are causing lymphoma or the disease activity itself is causing a lymphoma because majority of the patients who have been on anti dnf drugs are having high disease activity that's why we start with anti dnf so that's a quite controversy but right now it's a little clear that anti dnf drugs does not have any high risk of lymphoma because we have evidence from other disorders where we are using anti dnf drugs that they do not really increase the risk of lymphoma but they do have an increase risk of i mean the rheumatoid arthritis per se because the disease activity itself is causing a higher risk of lymphoma in this particular setting okay so this is a controversial statement but still currently it's clearly proven that they are not causing any increase risk of lymphoma and uh, more importantly uh, what 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 do you need to do so before doing anti dnf drugs before giving anti dnf drugs you have to search for latent tb suppose uh, do a chest x ray first if the chest x ray shows uh, some abnormality which means the patient is having a abnormal chest x ray then screen for tuberculosis screen for tuberculosis if the patient has tb then you start with anti tubercular therapy straight away going to start with add drugs straight away so if the chest x ray is normal then in this setting you have to screen for latent tb that's our latent tuberculosis if you are screening for latent tuberculosis the screening is negative then you can start with anti dnf drugs the screening is positive which means uh, your some of i mean manto or igra is coming as positive then in this setting you are going to treat with uh anti dnf plus you have to use uh, uh either a inh or a rifampicin regimens for latent tb so this is what you're going to see so in the setting of latent tb if you are suspecting a latent tb for that matters what is the drug that you're going to use so first either you can use inh at a dose of 5 mg per kg maximum dose is 300 mg and you can give for 9 months this is the most preferred regimen in indian practice 
and even who prefers this regimen only and uh, or you can give rifampicin alone at a dose of 10 mg per kg to a maximum dose of 600 mg which you can use for 4 months is not that much preferred regimen or you can use rifampicin and isoniazid with the dose which i already told you for a period of 3 months and this is more costly and not that much preferred the success rate is higher with inh for eradicating latent tb so you have to treat along with that you can start with anti tnf alpha drugs so because anti tnf alpha drugs are having extremely high risk of development of latent tuberculosis uh, i mean uh, for reactivation of latent tuberculosis so in that setting you need to be very careful why because as i told you this tnf alpha i mean whenever there is a latent tuberculosis there will be a infection that is the tb bacillus will be inside the macrophages and that will be contained by the granuloma so you know the wall of granuloma it will be macrophages and collar of t lymphocytes and inside there will be reactive histiocytes and there will be some macrophages that have swallowed this uh, tb bacillus but the tb bacillus nevertheless is still dormant inside in some patients it will be still dormant and still living but uh, they are not manifesting because it is contained how it is contained by formation of a granuloma so this kind of active granulomas where inside still the bacteria is still alive but uh, you have just contained the infection by producing a collar of lymphocytes and macrophages is uh, something called as a latent tuberculosis this is latent tb and we know for this granuloma formation the t helper 1 response is very important to hold the t helper 1 response you need this tnf alpha so to hold these macrophages together so once you give an anti tnf alpha drug you are going to break the granuloma which means the integrity of the granuloma will be lost and you are breaking the granuloma macrophages will disintegrate and the bacilli will move out easily resulting in the risk of reactivation of latent tuberculosis or dissemination of uh, tuberculosis so that's why we need to do a latent tuberculosis testing even if the chest x ray is completely normal and uh, how to screen for latent tuberculosis there are two options one is you have igra that is preferred by western countries but in india we prefer panto remember both are same we'll be discussing in uh, tb section if possible so both are basically same kind of test one is done as a skin test one is done in the blood that's all both test the th1 response and production of interferon gamma so that's why it's called interferon gamma release assay if the interferon interferon gamma is released in the skin because of the tubercular antigen and it produces an induration that is called as a manto test which means that's a clinical indicator of interferon gamma that's manto test on the skin igra is a laboratory evidence of interferon gamma production that is in excess in the setting of a uh, tubercular antigen response so you have two tests both can be used and uh, in indian setting we use both most of the times to be very double sure but uh, i mean guidelines clearly tell if one if use is more than enough so in western countries igra indian rntcp guidelines suggest usage of a manto test for, uh, for diagnosing this latent tb suppose if the patient is having a over tuberculosis in this setting you have to straight away start with an att regime plus you can give anti tnf also no problem along with att a sensitive uh, drugs whatever is sensitive you can give along with it you can start with anti tnf alpha drugs which means you can start anti tnf alpha drugs along with the att regime or along with the anti tubercular therapy but don't start anti tnf therapy alone if the patient is having some evidence of latent tuberculosis or if the patient is having some evidence of active tuberculosis you should not give so i think we have discussed uh, the important principles with regards to anti tnf alpha drugs the most important being a screening for tuberculosis and it's been long thought that in hepatitis b virus you cannot give anti tnf drugs in hcv virus you cannot give anti tnf drugs but this are all completely eradicated now even in the setting of hepatitis b virus even in the setting of hepatitis c virus you can start with anti tnf agents but it's a good antiviral cover why don't we use other biologicals in case of active tb uh, uh, no uh, because anti tnf drugs are extremely useful in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis and one of the important cytokines even the t helper 17 response is very important in uh, rheumatoid arthritis as i told you the clones are higher but this anti tnf i mean the tnf alpha is considered to be a very important cytokine as far as rheumatoid arthritis is concerned that's why you get a better response with anti tnf alpha drugs and compared to all the other biologicals anti tnf as a well documented and a long term safety data uh, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and the long term efficacy data is also uh, very very you know like compelling you to give a anti tnf alpha drug so that's why we are going to use anti tnf alpha in this setting and they are much cheaper compared to 
other anti tnf alpha i mean other uh, biological agents for example tocilizumab you know very costly anti tnf i can get at 7000 8000 rupees tocilizumab will cost around 30 40000 and um, if you want to start with rituximab it's going to cost around 20 30000 and the level of immunosuppression is going to be more with tocilizumab and with uh, rituximab compared to the of anti tnf alpha drugs so selectively so many advantages are there with anti tnf alpha drugs and safety data and efficacy data is also little high with anti tnf that's why we start with anti tnf as a first line biological agent as far as rheumatoid arthritis is concerned and we have many other drugs i have not talked about already i have told you in the beginning you can use jacinib like tofacitinib or baricitinib you can start with uh, your um, anti il1 therapy that is anakindra even though that is not that effective you can still start with and uh, many other drugs are there abatacept we have not talked about much so these drugs are also can be uh, started in the setting of uh, rheumatoid arthritis anti tnf can be i will ask you some trivia question so that you are going to answer now anti tnf drugs can be used in uh, ankylosing spondylitis true statement or false statement so let us keep a kind of a quiz so you are going to answer anti tnf drugs can be used in true statement or false statement i'm not getting any answers at all okay i'm getting a lot of false statements uh, i mean since false answers so which means definitely that must be wrong so true is the right answer all anti tnf drugs are approved for treatment in ankylosing spondylitis very very commonly used drug in ankylosing spondylitis so you can use anti tnf drugs in ankylosing spondylitis can anti tnf drugs be used in inflammatory bowel disease true statement or false statement inflammatory bowel disease true statement or false statement yes true statement anti tnf drugs are used in uh, inflammatory bowel disease but except one drug that is not shown to be effective in inflammatory bowel disease what is that drug because many people have told the right answer it can be used in both crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis of course crohn's disease is a non i mean granulomatous condition non cascading granulomas so of course uh, it can be used so both ibd as well as ulcerative i mean crohn's as well as ulcerative colitis but what is the one drug we are talking about that is not shown to be effective in ibd i'm getting different different answer but only one answer i'm not getting that is etanercept etanercept has not been shown to be effective in inflammatory bowel disease remember adalimab is one of the very very commonly used drugs left and right we use in indian practice very commonly used drug in ibd so it is etanercept not shown to be useful in setting of ibd and there are some studies which have shown even increase mortality in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease and uh, what is the anti tnf drug that has to be given by infusion all the other drugs are subcutaneous drugs the drug itself has a mnemonic in it and now everyone has to tell yes of course it is infliximab ifx it's an iv drug so that is the only thing that has to be given as iv infusion and apart from that all the other drugs will be giving as subcutaneous drugs still parenteral but this is the only thing that has to be given as iv infusion one drug can be given as both subcutaneous as well as iv what is that drug one drug which can be given both as subcutaneous drug as well as iv drug and not nay infliximab is wrong golimumab golimumab is a drug that can be given as both iv as well as subcutaneous infusion i mean a subcutaneous drug as well as iv infusion that's golimumab so what are the points we have told so ankylosing i mean uh, uh, anti tnf well useful in ankylosing spondylitis anti tnf well it is useful in ibd also both in crohn's as well as ulcerative colitis except one drug we talked about that is etanercept and all drugs can be given as subcutaneous route except infliximab that is given as iv route and one drug that can be given as both iv as well as subcutaneous route is 
Golimuna. And uh, uh, anti DNF drugs are useful in SLE. True statement or false statement? Anti DNF drugs are useful in SLE. True statement or false statement? That's a false statement. So, anti DNF drugs are not useful in systemic lupus erythematosus because they don't have any effect. And it's not causing any flare up of SLE, but they literally don't have any effect. So the pathophysiology is completely different in SLE. So that is not going to follow the traditional TL per one or TL per two route, which we'll be seeing tomorrow anyways. So they're not used in SLE. So apart from that, where else it's not used? Anti-DNF drugs is not useful in uncastrated vasculitis. For example, if you take vaginous granulomatosis, if you take uh, scleroda, I mean, sorry, uh, choke straw syndrome, microscopic polyangitis. It's absolutely not useful. So anti-NF drugs is not useful in any uncaustic vasculitis. And anti-NF drugs are not useful in large vessel vasculitis, like chain cell arthritis, tachyus arthritis. Uh, it's not useful. At the same time, it is not useful in the setting of Jokeran syndrome or even in scleroderma. Very limited utility. So other CTDs like SLE, Jokeran syndrome, and many different forms of vasculitis like uh, your uncastrated vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis like giant cell arthritis, it's not useful. anti nf drugs are not very useful because they have shown not to have a good response in that scenario. So I think we have discussed a detailed amount of information on anti dnf alpha drugs. So let us move on to the next important type of arthritis that is uh, seronegative spondyl arthropathies, SSA. Seronegative spondyl arthropathies, SSA. So what are seronegative spondyl arthropathies? Uh, first of all, the first letter tells that the patients are seronegative, seronegative, which means they should not have any positive antibodies. It's like they should be ANA negative. I mean, of course, you start with RF, RF negative. They should be RF negative and they should be ACPA negative. And at the same time, usually you forget one thing that they should be ANA negative as well. They should not have ANA positivity. And uh, then moving on to the second part of the name that is spondyl arthropathies. Spondylo arthropathies, which means they can have a spine involvement. Spine involvement possible. I'm not telling all the patients. Spine involvement is possible in this kind of arthropathies. And majority of them will be HLA B27 associated. But even though the frequency will be variable, but majority of them will be having at least some association with HLA-B27. Maximum association with ankylosing spondylitis will be seeing subsequently. And at the same time, if you take the arthritis, you're going to see in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, you can divide into two basically. One is called an axial predominant SSA and a peripheral predominant SSA. As far as Axial predominant SLA, SSA is concerned. The only one thing that you should know is ankylosing spondylitis. That is the axial predominant seronegative spondyl arthropathy. And the, as far as the peripheral predominant spondyl arthropathy is concerned, you have other things: psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis called as Rita syndrome, then IBD associated arthritis, otherwise referred to as enteropathic arthritis. So I can write enteropathic arthritis. That is IBD related arthritis. So these are peripheral predominant arthritis. Remember previously, there have been another arthritis that comes under this, that is juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Currently, they have removed this from the classification. So it's no longer HLA B27 related or it's no longer uh, rheumatoid arthritis also. But other name was given, that is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. This is a completely outdated name. It's not rheumatoid arthritis by any reason. It's a juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which we'll be seeing subsequently. But JA was there previously, but now many of the guidelines have removed JA from HLA B27 related arthritis. And there are some common features First, you need to know. There'll be some common features. All this HLA-B27 related arthritis. The first one is the inflammatory back pain they get. That's IBP. That's called as inflammatory back pain. Very commonly in the cases we write as IBP, inflammatory back pain. So this is due to sacroiletis usually. That's the reason why they get this inflammatory back pain. And uh, usually the mnemonic uh, for this inflammatory back pain is called as eye pain. That's a mnemonic. So here I stands for insidious onset. 
in serious onset that is a uh, little slow and uh, steady onset it's not a very sudden or acute onset and p stands for pain predominantly at night so that's very important because that's a classic feature of any inflammatory arthritis that am pain very important that's why i told you and a stands for age group of the patients will be usually less than 40 and uh, i'll tell you there are some exceptions in this especially in the form of psoriatic arthritis where it can happen age more than 40 also and the i stands for improves with exercise we know that that's the classical feature of inflammatory arthritis it improves with exercise or probably hot water and there will be substantial improvement with NSAIDs also. When you have heart fermentation, exercise, NSAIDs, they are going to have substantial improvement in this inflammatory back pain. And uh, N stands for no improvement with rest, which means rest actually increases the pain, but no improvement with rest. So this is a classical feature of the inflammatory back pain that we see that can be uh, given by pneumonia called eye pain. That's characteristic. That's given in many textbooks. Then we have we can have peripheral arthritis apart from the inflammatory back pain these individuals may can, can have a peripheral arthritis as far as the peripheral arthritis is concerned there are many points that are important they are typically going to be asymmetric and they can involve upper limb more than the i mean they're going to involve the lower limb more than the upper limb and more importantly they will be oligoarticular in nature i think i forgot to tell this what is the definition of oligoarticular and polyarticular when you call oligoarticular and when you call polyarticular i should have told in the initial evaluation of arthritis itself i forgot to tell this when you call oligoarticular whenever the number of joint involvement is less than or equal to 4 we call it as oligoarticular whenever the number of joint involvement is more than or equal to 5 we call it as polyarticular the best example of polyarticular involvement is rheumatoid arthritis and the best example of oligoarticular involvement is seronegative spondyl arthropathies. Even though there are so much of exceptions are there in this, especially in the form of psoriatic arthritis, nevertheless, this is very important again. So what are the exceptions? For example, psoriatic arthritis can happen in age more than 40. This is an exception. So you have to note that typically psoriatic arthritis mean age is 43 years only. So it defies the principles. And psoriatic arthritis can be symmetric, psoriatic arthritis can affect upper limb more than lower limb, and psoriatic arthritis can be polyarticular as well. That is why psoriatic arthritis is not like it's complete kind of an exception kind of a scenario. And uh, they can have spinal involvement. They can have spinal involvement. And in the long run, they can produce spinal rigidity also. That's why you called as bamboo spine. They can produce spinal involvement. And if they ask you what spine is very commonly involved, it is the uh, thoracolumbar spine. In fact, the lumbar spine is going to be the most common, followed by the thor thoracic spine. Lumbar spine followed by the thoracic spine. That's the commonest uh, area in the spine that will be involved in the setting of a serenity spondyl arthropathies. But again, cervical involvement is extremely rare and it's usually uncommon. It does not happen in serenity spondyl arthropathies. Again, for this year, psoriatic arthritis will be an exception where cervical involvement tends to be extremely common. In fact, the commonest area of the spine that is involved in psoriatic arthritis is the cervical spine. So, I mean, whatever you say, psoriatic arthritis generally tends to be a, a sort of an exception. And I mean, I'm not telling that always it will be symmetric. They can have asymmetric variants also, but very commonly uh, they produce symmetricity and it's one of the important exceptions as well compared to the other seronegative spondyl arthropathies, which I'll substantiate in some time in the form of a table. Then they can produce something called an enthesitis. What do you mean by an enthesitis? Enthesitis means inflammation of the uh, area of junction of the joint and the tendons. For example, at the, at the site of insertion of the ligaments and the tendons, if you get an inflammation, that's characteristic of an enthesitis. So inflammation at the site of insertion of tendons and ligaments. So usual sites of getting an enthesitis will be around the Achilles tendon. That's going to be the most common. That's called Achilles tendinitis. That's the commonest site for enthesitis in patients with seronitis spinal arthropathies. Then they can, you can have uh, in, inflammation at the point of insertion of the patellar tendon. They can get elbow epicondylitis because that's a very important area for insertion of multiple tendons. They can get plantar fasciitis. 
thing. I mean, plantar fasciitis will present with severe heel pain. And if you don't treat plantar fasciitis, they can have a reactive bone formation in the heel of the patient that can be seen in the x-ray as a calcaneal spur, you know that. And they'll present with the heel pain only. And they can produce pubic symphysitis also. Pubic symphysitis. These are examples of uh, the enthesitis that these patients are going to get. And ultimately, you know, like one of the important forms of enthesitis is costochondritis. This is usually seen in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis, very important finding, costochondritis. But others, usually they don't produce costochondritis that much, but ankylosing spondylitis is very high chance of producing costochondritis. And apart from that, uh, you can get something called dactylitis. So dactylitis means diffuse inflammation of the uh, one particular finger. It's very characteristic in the lower limbs. Upper limb dactylitis is very rare, even though psoriatic arthritis can cause upper limb dactylitis, but lower limb dactylitis is very common with other serenotic spondyl arthropathies. Uh, usually this kind of diffuse inflammation of the digit or diffuse swelling of the digit will result in development of something called a sausage shaped digit. Diffuse inflammation or swelling of the digit is what we refer to as sausage shaped digit. And uh, that's classical of a seronegative spondyl arthropathy. Then we have anterior uveitis. It can be acute or chronic. Very common, it will be acute. It can be acute anterior uveitis as well. And if they ask you the most common extra manifestation, most common extra manifestation of any seronegative spondyl arthropathy, anthrus anterior uveitis, most common extra manifestation. Apart from that, they can result in uh, instability and atlantaxial subluxation as well. Not cervical spine involvement, but nevertheless, they can produce atlantaxial instability. Because of that, they can produce atlantaxial subluxation, similar to that of rheumatoid arthritis. It's the only thing that is similar to that of rheumatoid arthritis, that atlantaxial subluxation. In both these disorders, it's going to be very rare because of the atlantaxial instability, but not due to cervical spine involvement. So these are the common features. When I talk about common features, I'm not telling all the features will be there in every single patient with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. But nevertheless, you know, like you can have certain features with uh, higher in incidence in certain diseases and certain uh, things will be in lower incidence in certain diseases. That, that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to put a small table so that I can compare each and every different category of ankylosing spondylitis in this particular table. And uh, one more important point to notice, HLA B27, positivity. So HLA B27 positivity is directly proportional to the axial involvement, which means whenever HLA B27 is positive, the patient has a high risk of having axial involvement in seronegative spondyl arthropathies. So which means they don't have any correlation with the peripheral joint involvement, but HLA B27 positivity has a high correlation with axial disease, that spinal disease, axial involvement. So that's another point that you need to know. So once we have understood this uh, common features, net, I mean, now it's better to put a form of a table so that I can write ankylosing spondylitis, then I can write psoriatic arthritis, very important. Then we have your reactive arthritis, that is Rita syndrome. Then finally we have entropathic arthritis. So I can write EA, entropathic arthritis or IBD associated arthritis. Then what is the disease type? The type of the disease is axial predominant here. All the others are peripheral predominant. Which means I'm not telling ankylosing spondylitis will produce only axial involvement. 99% they'll be axial. 1.5 to 1% can be peripheral. But psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, enteropathic arthritis are predominantly peripheral, 50 to 60% of the times. Sometimes they can have associated axial involvement also. But they are, we are talking about a predominant disease. This is an axial predominant. Others are peripheral predominant disease. That's the idea here. This is the first point. So that we need to know. Second, when they are having axial involvement, what is the percentage of axial involvement? That's the next thing. So that's very important. 100% axial involvement will be there in ankylosing spondylitis. As far as the psoriatic arthritis is concerned, they'll be having by around 20 to 40%. That's the involvement of uh, axial skeleton in psoriatic arthritis. And uh, Rita syndrome, around 40 to 60%. I think I'm writing from Delhi to Bombay kind of a scenario. I'll make it more neat. So as I told you, 
axial involvement will be 100 percentage in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis, 20 to 40 percentage in the setting of psoriatic arthritis, and uh, 40 to 60 percentage in the setting of a Rita syndrome or reactive arthritis, and only 5 to 10 percentage in the setting of enteropathic arthritis, that is IBD acid arthritis. And number three, we have uh, sacrolatus. And we need to know whether it is symmetric or asymmetric. As a sacrolate is concerned, ankylosing spondylitis tend to be symmetric, which means it's a very, very important point. The symmetric sacrolate always goes towards a ankylosing spondylitis. And that's a very common question in exam. Whenever you have a symmetric sacrolate, an exam is equal to ankylosing spondylitis. That's all. So radic arthritis, it will be asymmetric only. Rita syndrome also will be asymmetric only. Only other thing that has a symmetric arthritis, IBD acid arthritis, but this is less commonly diagnosed in exam. And usually they won't ask this. I mean, if you have history of IBD, then fine. Apart from that, patient is having symmetric uh, sacrolitis without any uh, GIT feature, then I don't really think it should be diagnosed as enteropathic arthritis. Number four, what is the HLA-B27 association? Remember, more than 95% of the times you will have HLA-B27 association in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. And almost only 20% of the times you will have association with psoriatic arthritis, 50 to 80% in the setting of reactive arthritis, and uh, it's going to be 5 to 10% in the setting of uh, uh, IBD acid arthritis, which means the maximum association with HLA-B27, again with ankylosing spondylitis. And as I told you before, one rule I would have told you, that HLA-B27 association is actually uh, you know, like correlating with axial involvement. And this also proves that fact that you can see that uh, they have a direct correlation. HLA-B27 involvement will have very important correlation with that of axial involvement. More HLA-B27 positivity, more the axial involvement. That's all. And number five, we want to talk about the peripheral arthritis. What will be the type of peripheral arthritis? Remember, ankylosing spondylitis will be involving the lower limb than the upper limb, and uh, all the other same thing. So even Rita syndrome, lower limb more than the upper limb, and lower limb more than the upper limb, and uh, but whereas in the setting of uh, psoriatic arthritis, it will be upper limb more than the lower limb. So in this situation, this is going to be a sort of an exception: upper limb more than lower limb. And at the same time, if you take the peripheral involvement. It's very frequent in the setting of a psoriatic arthritis, Rita syndrome, and in the setting of a enteropathic arthritis. But uh, yes, uh, but in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis, it is very infrequent. You don't really get uh, peripheral involvement. Very rare to have a peripheral involvement in the setting of a uh, ankylosing spondylitis. At the end of the table, let us take a SSR. I don't know what is SS. Okay. Then sixth, we are going to talk about the enthesitis, whether it is there or not there. And how common to have enthesitis in the setting of, okay, fine. You're wrong about a screenshot, fine. So enthesitis, enthesitis is very frequent. So I can put in plus better than, that's better. Enthesitis is very frequent in setting of ankylosing spondylitis. Enthesitis is frequent in the setting of psoriatic arthritis, frequent in the setting of your uh, reactive arthritis, but very rare in the setting of a uh, enteropathic arthritis. Then finally, we, I mean, seventh point, we have the dactylitis that we can get. Dactylitis, uh, very uncommon in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. Once again, uncommon in the setting of uh, enteropathic arthritis, but common in the setting of a uh, psoriatic arthritis and Rita syndrome, reactive arthritis. And we can have ocular involvement, eye involvement, and everything, all these things can produce antiviritis. I'm not denying that fact. All these things. All this can produce antiviritis. That's very classical of a seronegative spinal arthropathy, nevertheless. But remember, antiviritis is very classic in a HLAB, I mean, that uh, ankylosing spondylitis only. And that's the most common ocular manifestation in ankylosing spondylitis, and it's extremely common. In fact, almost 40% of the individuals will develop uh, antiviritis in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. But antiviritis, even though it can happen in other entities also, it's not that common like that of ankylosing spondylitis. But other disorders will tend to produce other kind of problems like uh, psoriatic arthritis can also produce conjunctivitis. Psoriatic arthritis can also produce 
scleritis and episcleritis so other forms also will come in but this is not seen in ankylosing spondylitis uh, as far as reader syndrome is concerned conjunctivitis becomes really important because you have the typical reader triad that are studied in reader syndrome i think uh, you would have forgotten what is the triad of readers that is conjunctivitis arthritis and urethritis you would have studied isn't it that's the readers triad so conjunctivitis becomes really important in the setting of a readers syndrome reactive arthritis and uh, ibd as arthritis you don't get anything much and as the skin features are concerned which means some cutaneous features could be there and there is no cutaneous features as far as ankylosing spondylitis is concerned but psoriatic arthritis of course so like the most important feature is psoriasis psoriatic skin lesions at the same time there can be associated nail pitting and onycholysis onycholysis is separation of the nail from the nail blade it's like nail tearing off from the nail blade that is onycholysis and nail pitting but please understand that there is 20 percentage of the patients with psoriatic arthritis they can have psoriatic arthritis only without skin involvement that's the point for the exams 20 percentage can have only psoriatic arthritis only joint involvement without any skin involvement which means it's very difficult to find out but uh, most of the time it will be missed rather than difficult to find out because sometimes psoriasis may be limited to only the scalp you may not have any psoriasis in the peripheral area so one of the important areas where you should uh, not uh, miss the psoriatic i mean psoriasis lesions to look for is the scalp so scalp psoriasis is very important sometimes it may be hiding inside so that's very important again so that's psoriatic arthritis and apart from that as far as the reader syndrome is concerned you know what are the characteristic skin lesions reader syndrome there are two skin lesions that are characteristic one is called a sarsenet balanitis yes sarsenet balanitis then is then second one is called a keratoderma blennerigicum keratoderma blennerigicum other is referred to as a palmo plantar keratoderma sarsenet balanitis remember sarsenet balanitis is inflammation of the gland spinis that's why we call balanitis gland spinis inflammation and as far as keratoderma blennerigicum is concerned it's a hyperpigmented lesions of the palms and the soles these are basically hyperpigmented lesion of palms and soles these are two characteristic skin lesions as far as reader syndrome is concerned then as far as ibd enteropathy arthritis arthritis is concerned you are going to get erythema nodosum one of the very common skin lesions in ibd arthritis arthritis and any ibd and second is pyoderma gangrenosum during gat discussion i will try to discuss this but remember erythema nodosum is very common in crohn's disease whereas pyoderma gangrenosum is very common in ulcerative colitis by the way and as far as the imaging is concerned Uh, typically you will be seeing some characteristic uh, x ray and uh, imaging findings the one thing is the bamboo spine everyone knows that why you get the bamboo spine why you get the bamboo spine in the first place because of the calcification of the ligaments yes because the calcification of the intervertebral ligaments and the side in between the ligaments everything will get calcified that's why you get the bamboo spine and more importantly you will get something called a syndesmophytes the syndesmophytes can be happening in any of this uh, disorders so but in the setting of a uh, ankylosing spondylitis it will be more of a marginal and symmetric syndesmophytes marginal and symmetric what do you mean by marginal if possible i'll show you the image so if you have this kind of vertebral column syndesmophytes are nothing but uh, this calcification of the paraspinal ligaments so this if it's close to the spine then it will be called as marginal if it's away from the spine it will be called as non marginal these are syndesmophytes and there will be speckle calcification of the intervertebral discs as well so typically in ankylosing spondylitis you're going to see something called a uh, marginal and a symmetric syndesmophytes that's going to the more important point so that symmetricity is very important and there are two symmetricity i told you one is the symmetric sacrolatus that's very important point in exam and second is the symmetric syndesmophytes these are also very important and you can develop something called a shiny corner sign the shiny corner is due to the sclerosis at the edges of the vertebra that's what we refer to as shiny shiny corner but even though i am here drawing it as black but in radiology you will be seeing as sclerosis there as will be more whiter so that's what we call as shiny corner sign 
then you will get something called a dagger sign. This called as either a dagger spine or a dagger sign, whatever. That is due to the intervertebral uh, interspinous ligament calcification. So you have vertebral column like this that is coming up to the coccyx. You have the interspinous ligaments between the spine. If the interspinous ligaments are calcified, and uh, that will basically look like kind of a dagger in uh, X-ray. So this is what we refer to as a dagger sign, or probably you can call it as a dagger spine as well. That's characteristic. And uh, you have something called a railroading, railroad vertebral column. So all these are basically uh, imaging evidences of ankylosing spondylitis in the first place. Then we are also going to have some imaging features in the setting of uh, psoriatic arthritis. Very classic imaging finding is the pencil and cup deformity. That's called pencil and cup DIP deformity. I'll show you in some time what do you mean by pencil and cup DIP deformity, but that's very classic. That's one of the X-ray findings that you need to know. Apart from that, uh, Ritter syndrome also can produce a kind of opera hand is a clinical finding. So we're just telling opera hand, that's a clinical finding. That's a deformed hand, telescoping of digits. A pencil and cup is the classic X-ray finding or imaging finding. And as far as the uh, Ritter syndrome is concerned, reactive arthritis is concerned, we are going to get syndesmophytes again, but not very commonly, but they will be asymmetric and a non-marginal type. Non-marginal means outside the borders of the vertebral column, non-marginal and asymmetric type of syndesmophytes. That's what you get in reactive arthritis typically. Mm -hmm. And uh, imaging finding, I don't think any specific imaging finding is there as far as the, uh, you know, like your enteropathic arthritis is concerned. Then let us move on to the other important uh, clinical features of uh, this disorder. Some other points that we can discuss as far as the clinical features is concerned. So number one, in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, you can have other problems like, I mean, uh, valar artery like aortic regurgitation. This will be followed by mitral valve prolapse, but the most common is still aortic regurgitation only. And costochondritis is very, very important in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, in a sense, like uh, this will be given in the exam as reduced to chest expansion. Whenever they give a patient to suggest you of an inflammatory back pain with this kind of a reduced chest expansion that is equal to ankylosing spondylitis in the exam, unless proved otherwise. So that's why that point is very important. And apart from that, they can have upper lobe fibrosis. One of the important causes of upper lobe fibrosis is ankylosing spondylitis once again. And they can cause IgA deposition in the kidneys. IgA deposition in the mesangium. They do not really cause IgA nephropathy, but uh, they can have a non-specific and uh, you know, like uh, non-problematic IgA deposition in the mesangium that can be seen in the kidney biopsy uh, sometimes if you really want. And uh, what else? I think this must be enough. For psoriatic arthritis, you need to know the types of psoriatic arthritis. What are basically the types of psoriatic arthritis that you have? There are many different types of psoriatic arthritis out there. One is called the asymmetric oligoarticular type. And remember in Western countries, temperate climates, this is supposed to be the most common type in temperate climates. But there are symmetric polyarthritic types also. This is very common in tropical climates. Tropical climates, these tend to be very common. But I don't know what you will answer. If you take a UK based textbook like Oxford textbook of rheumatology, they will kill some symmetric oligarthritis as common. If you take Harrison, uh, they will give symmetric polyarthritis as most common. So it depends. Again, where, where which climate you live in depends on that you will have a disease. And remember, this disease is the one that's going to mimic a rheumatoid arthritis most of the times because they involve small joints and they can exactly mimic a rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why you need to be very sure because this is one disease that has to be ruled out before making a diagnosis of seronegative rheumatoid arthritis as well. It could be a psoriatic arthritis. And number three, uh, you can get isolated DAP involvement. This is the most rarest form. I mean, or I can write not rarest, it's the least common form of psoriatic arthritis. And number four, you have psoriatic spondylitis only spine involvement, rare again, and uh, you can have arthritis mutilans. It's a mutilating form of arthritis, arthritis mutilans. So this is where you get that characteristic opera hand deformity or opera digits. 
So what do you mean by opera hand or opera digit is that the telescoping of the hand because of the severe arthritis and destruction of the bone in the joints, but the skin will not be destroyed. There will be redundant skin that will telescope within itself. That kind of telescoping of the skin within itself is very classical of a arthritis mutilence. And that's what we typically refer to as something called a uh, opera hand digit. And on the other hand, as well as Rita syndrome is concerned, the most important part of the Rita syndrome is the triad that will be asked in uh, many exams. The most important triad we know it is arthritis, urethritis, and conjunctivitis. And remember, as far as the arthritis is concerned, this arthritis is uh, more often a peripheral arthritis, and the most common joint that is affected is the knee joint. And more importantly, the conjunctivitis and the arthritis you see are basically sterile in the sense like they won't have any uh, inf infective agent in the sense like cultures will be negative. Conjunctivitis is also sterile and the arthritis is also sterile basically. Why I'm telling this point is because Rita syndrome is basically a reaction to some form of infection. Usually it happens after some form of infection. The usual infection that you need to know about uh, Rita syndrome is either it could be a GI infection, that's a gastrointestinal infection, or it could be a genitourinary infection. If you think about a GI infection, usually it will be due to shigella, flexionary, but that's a usual common agent, but there are a lot of other agents out there. I can put etc. It can be due to Campylobacter jejuni, it can be due to a lot of species of Salmonella. Anything can cause reactive arthritis, but for exams, you need to know about the shigella flexionary. And as far as the GU infection is concerned, many are there, but chlamydia, especially the L2B0 is going to be the most important. Uh, that can cause Rita syndrome. But according to me, you know, like uh, many things else can cause. Urea plasma, urolyticum has been shown to have some association. Gonococcus has been shown to have some association, but nevertheless, chlamydia is going to be the most common. Fine. So that is the reason why this urethritis that you're getting in these patients may not be sterile. May not be sterile in the sense they might be harboring some infectious organism like chlamydia. So that's why whenever you have a patient with Rita syndrome, it's important that you do a, a PCR for chlamydia because chlamydia is an intracellular organism and it's very commonly associated with Rita syndrome. That is the reason why chlamydia is something that you should uh, always check whenever a patient comes with Rita syndrome and has a urethritis. Whenever the patient has a urethritis, there is a lot of chance that the patient has got a genitourinary reader. Usually if the patient has got a gastrointestinal reader, a gastrointestinal reactive arthritis, urethritis is very, very uncommon. They don't really get, in fact, whenever the patient is having a genitourinary reader, related Rita syndrome, there is a lot of chance that the patient might have a urethritis and urethritis may not be sterile and they can have infectious agent. So which means it's an STD, sexual transmitted disease. That's why, of course, any urethritis, you take a swab and uh, you check for the organism in gram stain, do a culture. And uh, of course, apart from taking a gram stain and doing a culture, very important is to do a PCR. That is NAT, nucleic acid amplification test. Why you do a NAT? That is to rule out chlamydia. That's very important point. So because chlamydia being intracellular, it cannot be grown by cultures. It has to be uh, you know, like confirmed by NAT only. So that's why this triad is very important and that uh, understanding that the Rita syndrome is a reaction to underlying infection. It's not an infectious arthritis, but that arthritis is basically a reaction to the underlying infection. That's the take home point. That is Rita syndrome, reactive arthritis. And as far as the hybrid related arthritis is concerned, you have uh, two types of hybrid related arthritis. One is called a type one hybrid related arthritis and second is type two hybrid related arthritis. That's what we need to know. We have type 1 and type 2. As far as the type 1 hybrid related arthritis is concerned, it is going to be oligoarticular and asymmetric, but this has a better correlation with the underlying IBD activity. Correlation with the underlying IBD activity. This was once upon a time a Jipmer question, which has correlation with IBD activity. And the second one is polyarticular symmetric type, but uh, they do not have correlation. No real correlation with underlying IBD activity. So that's very important, clear? Or probably type two can also have an axial disease. And again, they do not have any correlation with the underlying IBD activity. So type one, oligoarticular has correlation with IBD activity, but type two polyarticular or probably it can have an axial involvement where they really don't have any much correlation with underlying IBD activity. So I think uh, this must be enough to 
tell about all the serendipitous bond arthritis. And I think we have not spoken about the treatment as such. Treatment is very important as well. So how to treat each and every different types of uh, arthritis approach. As far as ankylosing spondylitis is concerned, or any other uh, disorders are concerned, the NSAIDs are going to be the most important because they can reduce the pain drastically in any inflammatory back pain and serenagrous spinal arthropathies. So when you talk about NSAIDs, NSAIDs I will do, I mean, I mean, ankylosing spondylitis, NSAIDs are the first line of treatment. But long-term uh, treatment is difficult with NSAIDs because they're having renal side effects, cardiovascular effects, and at the same time they can produce uh, a kind of gastric, so many problems are there, but still that's going to be the first line management. And suppose if uh, not tolerated, not tolerated or in the sense like uh, you cannot use NSAIDs or there are some contraindications to the use of NSAIDs. In this setting, anti-TNF, alpha agents are going to be the best line of treatment. Remember, anti-TNF agents are best options currently for ankylosing spondylitis. That's why I asked that. Anti-TNF whether it can be used in ankylosing spondylitis or not. Yes, it can be used and it's going to be uh, showing one of the best responses. They ask you the best treatment right now for ankylosing spondylitis is anti-TNF drugs only. But it's not started up front. After trying NSAIDs only, you're going to start with uh, anti-TNF alpha drugs. And there are a lot of other biological agents that also approved for treatment in ankylosing spondylitis. For example, um, you have a drug called Secucuma, I mean, anti-AL17 drugs. Anti-AL17 drugs, uh, for example, Secucinumab, we know that. And we have Ixekizumab. I think I have described these drugs. Ixekizumab. All these drugs are effective in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis as well. And currently, uh, anti-IL-12 and IL-23 inhibitors are also tried in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. That is Ustekinumab. This is also tried in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis. Ustekinumab. On the other hand, for psoriatic arthritis, the first and first line treatment is methotrexate. NSAIDs are helpful, but uh, the first line treatment, of course, for psoriatic arthritis is going to be methotrexate. Steroids can be used during the time of flare, but methotrexate is a more important treatment. But remember, methotrexate is not effective in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis because methotrexate is not effective for uh, axial disease. Methotrexate can treat only the peripheral disease. Since ankylosing spondylitis is predominantly an axial disease, methotrexate will not be that effective. But methotrexate will be effective for peripheral disease. So methotrex is going to be the first line. And if you ask the best treatment, again, it's going to be methotrexate only. But of course, you have a lot of variety of options as far as psoriatic arthritis is concerned. You can use anti-DNF alpha drugs, of course. You can use ustekinumab, of course. You can use anti-IL-17 drugs, that is secukinumab and exekizumab are also approved for uh, psoriatic arthritis. Apart from that, you have the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. These are recently approved. PDE4 blockers. This drug is called as, uh, I mean, other PDE4 blockers that are used in COPD is what we call as silomilast and roflumilast. But what we use in uh, psoriatic arthritis is called as apremilast. Apremilast. This has immunomodulatory activity and has been approved for use in psoriatic arthritis, of course. And you can use jackinims, jack inhibitors like tofacitinib. Uh, we, we told already. So that is also approved for use in psoriatic arthritis. So these, I mean, some of these drugs are not approved for ankylosing spondylitis, but, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, this is very important. All these, I mean, extra drugs are also approved for psoriatic arthritis. Remember this uh, apremilast, that uh, this PD4 inhibitor that can produce significant amount of weight loss and has a very high risk of GI side effects, and that can result in discontinuation of the drug. That's been one of the questions, I think, maybe long time back in 2017 or 18. So they asked that uh, among all the drugs that is used in psoriasis, which is the one that produces significant amount of weight loss and a lot of gastrointestinal side effects, that's going to be upper last in that perspective. So I'll drop this off because of no space. Okay, this is how we're going to treat a psoriatic arthritis. Fortunately, anti-DNF, methotrexate, and all these drugs, whatever I've described, can be effective for both psoriasis as well as psoriatic arthritis. So it's going to be a double benefit. So it, it can be useful to treat both psoriasis as well as psoriatic arthritis. As far as reactive arthritis, Rita syndrome is concerned, it's mostly a self-limiting disease. That's the first thing that we need to know. Self-limiting in the sense it will be usually resolving within a period of a year, within 12 months. 
usually it can be treated uh, effectively with conservative therapy, which means you need a little bit of NSAIDs plus or minus steroids. That's more than enough. A short term of NSAIDs plus or minus steroids is going to be more than enough. And if still they do not respond to this NSAIDs and steroids, then you can go for biological agents. And uh, most important biological agent is anti-TNF alpha drugs in this scenario. It's approved for treatment in reactive arthritis also. Reactive arthritis also is underlying malignancy. No, we are talking about underlying infection. It's an infectious reaction, not a malignant reaction. It's an infectious reactive arthritis you're talking about. So biologicals can be used, uh, you know, like anti-TNF alpha drugs has been approved in the setting of uh, reactive arthritis as well. And uh, of course, this should be treated with empirical antibiotics also, especially if there is some evidence of infection, antibiotics very important. And especially if you're going to use doxy for extended course for three to six months very commonly because it's always a reaction to underlying infection even though the joints or the uh, eye does not show any active evidence of infection but still because it is a reaction to underlying infection so you have to strongly consider the use of antibiotics like doxycycline for a period of three to six months in this scenario and as far as IBD acid arthritis is concerned the most important is treatment of underlying IBD that itself is more than enough most of the cases plus symptomatic management with uh, NSAIDs probably with a little bit of steroids must do. And of course, IBD can also be treated with anti-TNF alpha drugs, I told you. So it's like, like a, I mean, waiting, I mean, it's like weighing which drug will be most effective in the particular scenario and that's what we really want. Clear. And remember, anti-TNF alpha drugs are very effective for that acute antirivitis also. Suppose the patient is getting recurrent acute antirivitis, and if the patient is having severe inflammatory eye disease like recurrent conjunctivitis, for that also anti-TNF alpha drugs will be extremely effective. So for that also they are approved and that point also you can note if you want. And I think this must be enough. I don't know, if everyone is asking about a screenshot, I think if you take a screenshot of this, will you be able to, you know, like see what's happening really? I really don't know. I mean. Many people are asking about the screenshot. So I think uh, you'll not be able to take a screenshot. You'll not be able to read. Anyways, you can uh, go through the video once again and you can take periodically. So I can show this much. So I think this is a good way to take a screenshot if you want. So all right. So I think we have discussed enough about uh, the different types of serum nitrous spinal arthropathy. It's a very important topic um, in exams as well as in real life also so where you need to know a lot of things about serenity spinal arthropathies after point number nine she wants to take a lot of screenshots okay how will you evaluate ankylosing spondylitis and uh, one more important point which we did not talk about ankylosing spondylitis is the presence of something called a positive showbus test Suppose if you're talking about something called a Schobus test, I told you. So can anyone tell what do you mean by Schobus test? This is one of my medal exam questions. When I was writing orthopedics medal exam, they asked this Schobus test because I got a case of ankylosing spondylitis there. What do you mean by Schobus test? 15 centimeters, normal, no. So ask the patient to stand and uh, take a 10 centimeter line, of course, like in the lumbar spine, when the patient is standing on the back, so I can draw the buttocks here, maybe that's looking very bad, so I don't want to draw. So when you draw the back here, and you're going to take a 10 centimeter line in the lumbar spine, lumbar spine, and this 10 centimeter line should be marked in the lumbar spine on standing, and ask the patient to, you know, like uh, bend down as much as possible. Just ask them to bend down as much as possible, as much as they can. And after bending down, of course, because of the extension, I mean, the movement of the lumbar spine and the entire spine will stretch because the patient is bending down. This, you know, like uh, line should get expanded because of the stretching of the spine. And I mean, you compare this with the that length. So now the new length, let us assume this is going to be the new length after bending. So this is after bending the back. Now there's a new line on uh, bending. 
and the difference between these two uh, segments should be at least more than five centimeter. If you take the difference, now it should be at least difference between the first and the second should be at least more than five centimeter. That's considered to be normal. Suppose if it is less than five centimeter, that's considered to be a positive Schober's test. Positive Schober's test, and uh, that's a sign of a limited lumbar spine motion. So positive Schober's test means you are having a limited lumbar spine motion. It doesn't mean that uh, you're having ankylosing spondylitis. It just tells that uh, it's a limited lumbar spine motion. Clear? That's what it indicates. Limited lumbar spine motion. So that it can be happening in a variety of conditions like uh, even fluorosis can produce this kind of a picture because fluorosis also affects the, you know, like your uh, lumbar spine and the entire spinal vertebral column. And even it can seen it can be seen in a disease called alcaptanuria that's called ochronosis even there you can get this kind of problems so you can differentiate three disorders that will be asked in exams one is ankylosing spondylitis second is fluorosis and third is alcaptanuria that is ochronosis so we can talk about the Schober's test in this scenario that is spine involvement and second is skin pigmentation. And third is the dental involvement. So remember, ankylosing spondylitis, fluorosis, alcaptanuria, all these things will have Schober's test positivity and uh, you will have this kind of spine involvement. But skin involvement is very typical of uh, alcaptanuria where they'll have skin hyperpigmentation and they won't have any skin features in the setting of fluorosis and ankylosing spondylitis. We clearly know that. And as far as dental involvement is concerned, that is very suggestive of a uh, fluorosis rather than that of a uh, ankylosing spondylitis and alcaptanuria. Alcaptanuria, you know, uh, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. And what is the enzyme that is deficient here? What is the enzyme that is deficient in alcaptanuria? That is ochronosis. Yes, that's called a HGO. That's called a homogen state oxidase enzyme. So that's the enzyme that is deficient. So because of the deficient enzyme, you will have increased amounts of homogenistic acid. Homogenistic acid. And uh, I mean, this is also the reason why they have dark urine or a pigmented urine on standing. I mean, uh, standing means not like if they stand and piss, they have a dark urine. Means uh, when you take the, collect the urine and keep it in air for some time the homogenistic acid will react to the oxygen in the air and they get oxidized and they will produce that dark color that's what we call as dark urine on standing clear so i mean this is a characteristic feature of uh, you know like your uh, homo i mean ochronosis ochronosis typically is like can be diagnosed with the help of a triad where they're going to have a spinal rigidity spine involvement is very common in this setting and they can have this kind of skin pigmentation and this dark urine on standing. This will be the exam question. So this is alcaptanuria. And spinal involvement is common in alcaptanuria as well. And this is another point that you need to know about the Schober's test. I think we have completed. And only one thing that is still left is how to evaluate an ankylosing spondylitis. Suppose if you suspect an ankylosing spondylitis, which means a patient coming with an IBP plus less than 40 years of age, so how will you evaluate ankylosing spondylitis? So if you suspect ankylosing spondylitis, the first test that we do is, I mean, X-ray of the uh, sacroiliac joints. To take the X-ray of the sacroiliac joint, we need a special view called as Ferguson's view. Ferguson's view is a special view that uh, directly, I mean, picturizes the sacroiliac joint in this setting. So if the X-ray is positive, which means X-ray is suggestive of Ankylosing spondylitis in the sense you are going to have a, a sacroiliac joint sclerosis, SA joint sclerosis. And if it is symmetric, of course, the disease you are dealing with ankylosing spondylitis, there is nothing else. If X-ray of the sacroiliac joint is negative, then you can go for an MRI, which has very high sensitivity. If MRI is showing uh, bone marrow edema. So bone marrow edema is a sign of sacroiliitis. I'm going to see near the sacroiliac joint. Near sacroiliac joint, if I'm having the bone marrow edema, that's a sign of a sacroiliitis. 
So if it is there, then again, it's likely to be ankylosing spondylitis only, especially if it's symmetric. Remember, if it's asymmetric, then um, it's unlikely to be uh, ankylosing spondylitis. It would be a symmetric sacroiditis. If it's negative, if it's not, say, no bone marrow edema, so ankylosing spondylitis is very unlikely. Very unlikely. So which means if they ask you the sensitive investigation, my answer will be MRI only. MRI is the most sensitive investigation for picking up the sacroiditis, not for diagnosing ankylosing spondylitis. Rather than to pick up the sacroiditis, MRI is going to be extremely sensitive. But first investigation we do is always the X-ray of the sacroiliac joint. But remember, what is the role of HLA B27? Remember, in seronegative spondylar arthropathies, it has a very poor role because very few patients will have HLA B27 positivity. But in ankylosing spondylitis, if your disease of concern is AS, it has a good negative predictive value, which means almost every patient will have uh, you know, HLA-B27 positivity. So suppose if HLA-B27 is negative, it's unlikely to be ankylosing spondylitis. That's why this table is also telling the same. I told you the HLA-B27 positivity will be more than 90-95 percentage in ankylosing spondylitis, which means it's a sensitive investigation. So if HLA-B27 is negative, then it can actually a kind of rule out ankylosing spondylitis in patients with inflammatory back pain. So that's the role of HLA-B27, but we generally don't do it. But for other serenogative spondyl arthropathies, HLA-B27 has a very poor value. But HLA-B27 will have a good value if the patient has axial involvement, I told you. HLA-B27 can be positive <clears throat> if the patient is having axial involvement. And one more important problem is HLA-B27 has a poor specificity. So in the sense like... Um, even normal population can have up to 5, 5 7 percentage can have HLA-B27 positivity. So not all patients will develop ankylosing spondylitis. Very few will develop ankylosing spondylitis in them. So it's not a very specific test, but becomes sensitive under two conditions. One, if the patient is having axial involvement. Second, if the disease of suspicion is ankylosing spondylitis, which means there is an axial involvement nevertheless. So in that setting, HLA-B27 may be a little sensitive and they can have a little higher negative predictive value. Apart from that, HLA-B27 is not a very useful test in this situation. I think uh, that's it. So we have discussed uh, tremendous detail on, I mean, seronegative spondyl arthropathies. And I think today evening session is very fruitful as well. We discussed a lot of things about arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And again, this is another power pack session and we'll see tomorrow with uh, more rheumatological conditions. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye.